A very good afternoon, everyone. I am Zina Chauhan from G Healthcare India. On behalf of G Healthcare, I welcome you all to today's FMG webinar on abdominal sonography. Explore the Pandora box, which is a joint education initiative of FMG and G Healthcare, powered by Logic Technology by G Healthcare. Today we have with us pioneers from across Asia to enlighten us. A very warm welcome to our esteemed faculty. Now I will introduce Dr. Sudhir Gokhale, who is also a moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Sudhir Gokhale he is an honorary professor of radiology at Sri Aurobindo Institute of Medical Sciences, Indore, India. Dr. Gokhale also did his MD in radio diagnosis in 1982. and done his fellowship in abdominal sono abdominal and vascular radiology from france in 1985 he is the current vice president of fsm he is a past president of ifumb he has published several papers in national and international peer review journals he has delivered several prestigious orations and over 200 lectures in national and international conferences his article on abdominal wall sonography featured amongst the top 5 most read articles of journal ultrasound medicine for 4 years he has contributed chapters to three books he is a fellow of icri icu icmu and aiu Before we get started, due to current pandemic situations, there has been huge traffic load on internet services. If you experience temporary interruption in the transmission, kindly bear with us. We will sort it out immediately and resume. Now I welcome Dr. Sudhir Gokhale sir to address our viewers. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Zinat. Welcome, friends. Welcome to the first. I have some G webinar that we are having today on abdominal ultrasound. As you know, AFSAM is a federation of uh, ultrasound societies of different countries. As on today, uh, there are about 18 uh, member countries in AFSAM with over 22,000 members, and AFSAM is the largest member organization of World Federation of Ultrasound. so we are uh, because of the covid we can't really have physical meetings and therefore uh, we thought it best to have uh, the meetings over internet and i am really happy that we have a galaxy of stalwarts in ultrasound participating in this webinar from all over asia and i welcome all my fellow faculties who have spared uh, their valuable time uh, for this webinar So today our uh, first speaker uh, we uh, have uh, Professor Yang Liang Wang. He is from uh, Taipei, uh, and he is um, an honorary professor of radiology at uh, Lingku Chang Gung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. He graduated from College of Medicine, National University of Taiwan in 1980. He is currently the president of Asian Federation of Societies in Ultrasound and Medicine and Biology. He is a prolific writer. He has published more than 340 papers. He has delivered 167 invited speeches, including 95 in international conferences. He is a reviewer of 21 medical journals. He is a winner of 19 awards and honors. He has been a president or organizer of nine international congresses. He is an associate editor of Journal of Thoracic Imaging. He is the chief editor of Journal of Radiological Sciences and an, on the editorial board member of Cardiovascular Imaging Asia. So, Professor Wan today is going to speak on sonography of spleen. Professor Wan, please. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction by Dr. Gokhel. Uh, on behalf of the AFSM, I like to extend my sincere appreciation to Dr. Gokhel for his time 
and effort in arranging this uh, webinar. It is my great honor and pleasure to join this uh, webinar meeting. What I'm going to do today is the sonography of the spleen. I look to, I'd like to share my experience with all the audience. Now we'll start to show the video. Sonography of spin. I have nothing to declare. These are the outline and content of my speech today. Introduction. The spleen is the largest lymphatic organ or RH system in human body. Focal lesion of spleen are relatively rare. Its critical capital functions are formation, storage, and breakdown of blood cells, storage of blood clotting factor 8, taking part in antibody biosynthesis. Splenomegaly and hypersplenism usually result from systemic disease. Spleen malfunction may be induced by infectious disease, hemolytic anemia, myelo or lymphoproliferative disorders, leukemia, or autoimmune disease. Spleen volume measured by a summation of areas technique from non-enhanced CT is more reliable but has a disadvantage of ionizing radiation. The mean normal spleen volume is around 184 cubic centimeter. The spleen volume in this patient with myelofibrosis is more than 900 milliliter. Splenomegaly. Etiology of splenomegaly include liver cirrhosis, portal hypertension, infection, malignancy, leukemia, hepatitis, amyloidosis, and hematopoietic disorder. The mean splenic dimension in normal adults are 10.7 cm in length, 7.4 cm in wide, 4.4 cm in depth. Men have larger spleens than women. For easier remember, during scanning, please consider splenomegaly if the length is larger than 12 cm, the wide is larger than 7, and depth is larger than 4 cm. Spleen size. How well do linear ultrasound measurement correlate with 3D CT volume assessment? The most accurate single measurement is spleen wide measure on the longitudinal section with the patient in the right lateral decubitus position. However, splenic length also correlates well with splenic volume. This is the schematic diagram showing the method for measuring spleen length, wide, and depth on longitudinal and transverse splints. We have to mention the prolate ellipsoid method. The splenic volume equal to 0.524 Multiply, multiple by length, wide, and thickness, which provides the greatest overall accuracy. The benign focal splenic lesion comprises many lesions. However, cyst, infarct, hemangioma, lymphangioma, hematoma, and abscess are relatively common benign lesions. Non-parasitic cysts are classified to primary cyst or true cyst, secondary or pseudo cyst. The image on the right shows multiple cystic nodule in the spleen associated with calcification with cast acoustic shadow. This is a benign lesion. This is the corresponding CT of this patient. The most common malignant focal splenic lesions are due to lymphoma and metastasis. Ultrasound finding of benign and malignant focal splenic lesion. 
when you compare the solitary versus multifocal diffuse region, you could appreciate when the region is solitary, it is much more likely to be benign with statistically significant. When there are neoplasm elsewhere in the abdomen, the focus plate lesions are more likely to be malignant with statistically significant. Ultrasound finding of benign and malignant focus plate lesion. When the mass is anechoic or when the mass is associated with high echo with shadow due to calcification or gas, those lesions are significantly more likely to be benign. While when the lesions are hyperechoic or mixed echoic, or when the lesions are associated with target sign, those lesions are more likely to be malignant with statistically significant. Differentiation of benign versus malignant focal lesions. Signs suggesting benign, the PBV. Both an equic mass or lesion with echogenic foci due to gas or calcification, both has the PBV of 100% for the lesion to be benign. A solitary lesion has a PBV of 85% in predicting the lesion to be benign. For both hyperechoic, mixed echoic lesion or multifocal or diffuse lesion, both have the PBV of 70% in predicting malignancy. Neoplasm elsewhere in the abdomen or nodules with target sign, both have PBV of 100% in predicting the lesion to be malignant. This is a case of epidermal cyst. A young boy came to our hospital due to left upper quadrant pain. There is an anechoic cyst, 100% PBV for benign. A patient showing a solitary solid hypoechoic mass in the lower pole of the spleen. CT without enhanced shows hypodense mass. CT with enhancement shows the mass is relatively hyperdense. The angiography shows the mass is very hypervascular. What do you think? What is your diagnosis? Is it benign or malignant? This is solitary lesions which has 85% PBV for benign. This is a case of hematoma. Hematoma as you know, that is due to overgrowth of mature cells. It could be fine, found in lung, liver, kidney, and spleen. A diabetic patient with chief complaint of fever chills showing an hyperechoic mass lesion in the spleen. The corresponding CT shows gas content in the lesions, suggesting gas producing splenic abscess due to gram-negative bacilli. A case of malignant lymphoma featuring multifocal and honeycomb-like lesion. The PPV for malignancy is 70%. In case of splenic metastasis, 70% has concurrent neoplasm elsewhere in the abdomen. The PBV for malignancy is 100%. Split metastasis with target sign. Target sign was found in 15% of lymphoma and in 10% of metastasis in our cases. Target sign has a PBV for malignancy is 100%. When you find a mass with target sign, the differential diagnosis should include candidiasis. 
both benign and malignant focal splenic lesion may feature complex. This is a case of mild splenomegaly with a complex mass lesion at the lower pole of the spleen. The patient has chief complaint of fever. After ultrasound guide finding aspiration and culture, it shows splenic abscess. There are some pitfalls in scanning of spleen. The cause of false negative errors include small size or isoechogenicity of the lesion, or due to technical factors that the lesions are located within the dead zone of transducer or beneath the ribs. The juxta splenic lesion may lead to false positive errors. What you should think when the spleen? You have to consider excision of the spleen, asplenia, citrus inverses, wandering of ectopic spleen, and obliteration of spleen by surrounding ribs and gas. Examples of false positive finding of focal splenic lesion by ultrasound. The image on the left shows inverted plural lesion with hydrofibrosorax. You can appreciate this is the plural lesions which is located later to the spleen. Another example, a case of exophytic gist from stomach with invasion to spleen. During the scanning, you may misinterpret this gist from stomach as a splenic lesion. Ultrasound shows peripheral wedge shaped hypoacute lesions due to infarct. Another patient showing the CT, showing infarct in the CT. The splenic infarct is one of the most common lesions in case of false negative result of ultrasonography. A case of situs inversus and polysplenia. In such a case, you could not find the normal spleen in the left upper quadrant. You could appreciate multiple hypoequax nodular mass due to polysplenia in right upper quadrant. Let's talk about the spleen elastography. Background. Elastography allows the assessment of tissue stiffness. It is based on the assumption that the pathologically changed tissue is harder than healthy tissue. Studies on liver fibrosis, the musculoskeletal system, as well as breast, prostate, testicular, and thyroid nodules acknowledge this assumption. The splenic vein is directly connected to the sonography of spleen. spleen. Studies on liver fibrosis, the musculoskeletal system, as well as breast, prostate, testicular, and thyroid nodules acknowledge this assumption. The splenic vein is directly connected to the portal vein. As a consequence, disease that affect blood flow in the portal vein may also affect the spleen. Spleen stiffness examination may therefore be useful in the diagnosis process of liver fibrosis, portal hypertension, and esophageal viruses. There are two ways, two types of elastography. One is MR elastography, the other one is ultrasound elastography, which may be divided into qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative methods, elasticity value are obtained by exerting rhythmical pressure on the examined tissue is the least technically advanced. Technical progress has led to the formation of quantitative EG such as transient elastography, fibroscan, RFI, and shear wave elastography, SWE. The elastography technique 
currently available can be categorized by the physical quantity measures, compression imaging, and shear wave imaging. The diaphragm on the left shows compression or stress imaging. The image at the center and the right shows shear wave imaging. This is the so-called point shear wave used in RFI. And this is the 2D shear wave elastography. And this is the transient elastography in fiber scan. Longitudinal and transverse wave. A longitudinal wave is a wave in which the particle of the medium move in a direction parallel to the direction that the wave moves. In general diagnostic ultrasonography, sound velocity is around 1500 meter per second in biological soft tissue. A transverse wave is a wave in which particle of the medium move in the direction perpendicular to the direction that the wave moves. This is the diaphragm showing longitudinal wave and transverse wave. In shear wave image, the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Thus, the shear wave is a transverse wave. Its velocity, around 1.7 meter per second in liver and 2.3 meter per second spin, is much smaller than that of the longitudinal wave, which is around 1500 meter per second in biological soft tissue. Technical guideline by Wolfram. The examination was performed through intercostal space after at least four hours of fasting. The optimal location for maximum shear wave generation is four to 4.5 centimeter from the transducer. The transducer should be perpendicular to the spanning surface. Three or five measurements may be appropriate for 2D SWE. The 2D SWE sample box should be about 3 cm with circular ROI 1 cm in diameter inside. The measurement is obtained by placing the ROI in the area where the shear wave propagate uniformly assessed by looking at the propagation map. The interquartile range should be used as a measure of quality. This is a 2D shear wave elastography. The image on the left is color elastography. The image on the right is propagation map. As you could appreciate the surface of sample box should be 1 cm away from the splenic surface to avoid reverberation artifact or pressure effect. The surface of sample box should be parallel to the splenic surface to have an incidental beam perpendicular to the interface to gain optimal specular echoes. This is a color map. This is a propagation map in liver elastography. Normal liver elastography. The reliability of measurement was tested by the propagation map as the lines are parallel to each other and the intervals between them are constant. Thus, the measurement is considered reliable. Using the region of interest, the stiffness was 5.8 kPa. The upper one is normal liver, the lower one is normal spin. This is the color elastography, this is the wave propagation map. Question number one, what kind of waves are there in propagation map? What do you think of this wave? Is this a longitudinal wave or transverse wave? The correct answer is transverse wave. Question number two. 
why the wave in river are much close than those in spring. This is because the transverse wave in river is 1.7 meter per second, which is slower than that 2.3 meter per second in the spin. Question number three. Why the sun velocity in propagation map is much lower than 1500 meter per second, which is in the longitudinal wave? This is re related to the characteristic of the sound and the media. Let's talk about the clinical application of SE. SE might be used for non-invasive liver fibrosis assessment. Spring sickness changes early than liver hardness in patients affected with HCV or SPV without significant liver fibrosis. It correlates with blood flow change in portal vein, which helps detect portal hypertension. Sleep, sp spleen stiffness is helpful in the prediction of esophageal viruses. Spleen elasticity assessment could be a supplementary tool in monitoring tips, biliary atresia before and after cassai, proto-enterostomy, and myelofibrosis. Study demonstrated spleen stiffness correlate with liver fibrosis and is helpful in determining the level of fibrosis in the metaverse scoring system. In patients infected with hepatitis B or C virus, spleen stiffness increase even when liver elasticity is unchanged. You could appreciate this table. The higher the metaverse score, the higher the spleen stiffness. Liver and spleen stiffness in patients with liver cirrhosis and esophageal viruses. The table on the left shows patient with cirrhosis on this column, this um, column with normal subject. The table on the right shows all the cirrhotic patients without esophageal viruses and with esophageal viruses. You could appreciate both the stiffness of liver and spleen are significantly higher in cirrhotic patient in comparison with those in normal subject. Similarly, both the stiffness of liver and spleen in cirrhotic patient with esophageal viruses are significantly higher than those without esophageal viruses. Spleen elastography in patient with CML. A 22-year-old male with CML and huge splenomegaly. The spleen span is 27 cm. The kilopascal value of nearly 39 is much higher than the normal value of 17 kilopascal. Summary 1. In case of solitary lesion, inadequate mass, or echogenic foci due to gas or collection, consider the benign process. In case of focus plate lesion, which is hyperechoic or misechoic, multifocal or diffuse lesion, neoplasm elsewhere in abdomen, nodule target sign, you have to consider those lesions are more likely to be malignant. Summary 2. Spleen is the organ with the highest rigidity. The mean value of spleen stiffness is 16 to 70 kilopascal. Spleen stiffness correlates with liver fibrosis and is helpful in determining the level of fibrosis in the metabar scoring system. In patients infected with hepatitis B or C virus, spleen stiffness increases even when liver elasticity remains unchanged. The practical usefulness of spleen elastography in monitoring tips in assessing biliary atresia and hematological disease 
could be further investigated. Thank you very much. Now, That's all good let's, let's move to the question. That's how the questions, Rishi. <laughs> All right, till they run the poll, I have a couple of questions coming in from the audience for Dr. Vaughan. And one question that uh, um, uh, is asked by Mridula is that if you find a small spleen, then do you consider it abnormal? A spleen which is four centimeters, five centimeters. I think uh, that is still, uh, I can say, is still normal. But uh, you have to consider whether the patient has history of splenic infarct or not. You know, there's a term so-called autosplenectomy. That can be happen in case of previous chronic infarction. So the the term autosplenectomy should be considered if the patient has repeated a chronic history of infarct. That's my answer. That's a very good okay. question. Thank you. So that was uh, the poll that they ran for the first question, splenic size, focal splenic lesion, which one of the following is correct? And about half of them have answered that the ecogenicity and shadowing is much more likely to be malignant. Is that yes. correct answer? Right. Uh, more than 50 percent, they made a good answer. That's the right answer. Okay. Whenever there is mass with high echo, either due to gas or calcification, that's most likely to be the benign lesion. Okay. Let's have the second question. All right. There was another... Uh, uh, question from audience about the one measurement for splenic size. Do you consider only splenic length as a good enough measurement? That's a very good uh, question because daily practice, you know, we have overloaded with so many patients. If you really want to measure the spleen, of course, the first one you have to measure the spleen's length. The second one, you should measure the spleen wide at the level of splenic hilum. And this index will also give you a good data. Anyhow, according to my daily practice, as we are in the Asian country, whenever I do the spleen, ultrasound of the spleen, when the spleen span length is less than 10 centimeter, I would say that's normal. If the spleen span is 10 to 12, centimeter, I would say that is uh, borderline. Whenever it is over 12, that is definitely, I would say, that is spinomegaly. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, do we have the poll for the second question ready? May I explain now? Yes. The correct answer. Yeah, the question is uh, which one of the following descriptions is incorrect? In electrography, the shear wave is a transverse wave. The transverse wave, the particle motion is perpendicular to the propagated wave. So the correct answer should be number two. Uh, most of them, 37% uh, made a good answer. That's great. Good. What I'm uh, curious, you know, when I study about the electrography, as I, when I was the resident, we all know that the sound velocity in biological tissue is around uh, more than 1500 meter per second. But when we do the electrograph, it was found the Sound velocity in liver and spleen is relatively 
slow. The boss in spin, the sound velocity is only 2.3 meter per second in normal spin. So I further uh, study about this. Actually, in our textbook, when, when we are resident or when we are the student, the sound velocity of more than 1500 in biological soft tissue, that is related to the longitudinal wave. And in the electrography, they are showing the, the shear wave is the transverse wave. The velocity is much, much slower than that uh, longitudinal wave. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mon. Thank you for that nice talk on spleen. Now we move on to our next agenda and the next speaker is uh, myself. So I'll share my screen now. And I'm going to talk on um, sonography of uh, gallbladder. For those who joined late, I will introduce myself. I am Sudhir Gokhale from Indore, India. And I have been practicing ultrasound for last 30, 35 years. I am a past president of IFUMB and the current vice president of AFSUM. So without wasting much time on introductions, let us start uh, looking at the gallbladder. We ideally want to see the gallbladder when the patient has been fasting for some time. We know the function of gallbladder is to store bile and uh, to contract in response to the ingestion of food and push all that bile into the digestive tract uh, for digestion. So when the patient has had a meal, his gallbladder is already contracted and that's not an ideal situation. So we need to see the patients when they are at least four to six hours, I will say ideally six hours fasting. And uh, we should examine the gallbladder in different position. Remember that gallbladder is a slightly mobile and flexible structure and the contents of gallbladder are, all, are mostly flex, are also mobile. Therefore, therefore it, it's, it's essential that we examine the gallbladder when putting the patient in different position. The easiest thing is to turn the patient on the left side or make the patient sit up, make the patient erect and check again. We will look at the shape of the gallbladder, it is not very consistent. It is typically described as a pure shaped cystic structure with a long neck. But more important than shape is the wall thickness of the gallbladder. And normally it should be less than 3 millimeters. And we agree that the transverse diameter, if we measure in transverse uh, axial scans, should be less than 4 centimeters of a normal gallbladder. Now, sometimes the gallbladder appears to have septic, which is not true. There, is, there are no true septations in the gallbladder. What they are actually are folds in the wall of the gallbladder. The gall, gallbladder is a sinus structure. And when we cut the gallbladder in a different plane, they look like septations. But there are two consistently seen variations in the shape of the gallbladder that we should pay attention to. One is the Hartman's pouch and the other is the Frisian cap because sometimes gallstones or pathology might lurk in these areas, which might be overlooked in a very quick examination. People have missed Phrygian stones in Phrygian cap, polyps in Phrygian cap because it was not uh, scanned properly. And very rarely the gallbladder can be extremely tortuous, almost a sigmoid gallbladder and S-shaped gallbladder. So you need to scan uh, the gallbladder and look at the gallbladder in its entirety. Uh, congenital anomalies of gallbladder are not very common. Uh, rarely we see complete duplication of the gallbladder. Sometimes there can be a small uh, diverticulum from the gallbladder, but they are extremely rare. As uh, is another rare abnormality is that absence of gallbladder, agenesis of gallbladder. No matter how you search on ultrasound, you don't see the gallbladder at all. The first thing to do is to call the patient back when he's really, really fasting. Best thing is to call him back fasting overnight and search whether it is at some other place than normal. Sometimes you can get an intrahepatic gallbladder or a gallbladder placed totally on the right side. But if you consistently don't see the gallbladder, then you think of gallbladder agenesis, but the confirmation is usually done by doing a HEDA scan or by doing an MR, uh, MRCP, which are much more uh, sensitive and specific for diagnosing agenesis of gallbladder. 
Collier lithiasis is the commonest problem that we come across. Typically, stones are seen as ecogenic foci, and these ecogenic foci produce an intense acoustic shadow. So you'll always see a, a dense shadow behind, behind these foci. The foci, the, the first interface of the stone usually produces intense reflections. But sometimes you might get this double layered appearance depending on the consistency of the gallstone. Another characteristic of gallstones is that they are mobile within the gallbladder. So if you ask the patient to turn on the other side or make the patient erect, the gallstone will usually go into the dependent part and that is very very useful in differentiating a suspect gallstone from a polyp. Gallstones can be multiple, they will mostly all of them will cast shadow. Sometimes you might see gallstones of different shapes and some faceted stones may be visible uh, on your scan. And rarely you might get stones which are floating in the gallbladder. They don't remain in the dependent area, but they are floating and therefore they come in non-dependent area. But they'll still cast a shadow. So you can see the shadow on the other side of the gallbladder. Huge sometimes the cholesterol stones might float within the gallbladder. Rarely you might come across a gallbladder which totally looks echogenic. And that is because either it contains a, a, a milk of calcium bile or it is full of microlithiasis. So best thing is to again change the position and see whether it forms a label. So you know that it is not a calcified gallbladder wall, but it is a normal wall of the gallbladder and the gallbladder is full of either milk of calcium bile or it is full of microlithiasis. Very rarely the contents of the gallbladder might not be stones and you might rarely get parasites into the gallbladder and then a real-time scanning will show you that this is not one single stone but you can follow it up and see that it really is actually a coiled structure within the gallbladder lumen. Uh, cholecystitis is the commonest uh, disease of gallbladder that we come across. About 90 to 95% of acute cholecystitis is related to gallstones with about 5 to 10% cases due to acalculus cholecystitis. The typical signs of cholecystitis that have been described are that we see a uh, impacted calculus uh, in the cystic duct or neck of the gallbladder, positive sonographic Murphy sign, thickened gallbladder wall more than 3 millimeters. Uh, in, in, in thickness, distension of the gallbladder lumen, pericholecystic fluid collection, hyperemic gallbladder wall on color doppler because of the inflammation. All these signs uh, uh, indicate that this gallbladder is inflamed. So typically what we see is a mildly distended or moderately distended gallbladder with a large stone in the neck of the gallbladder and it must be obstructing because this stagnant gallbladder shows a fluid fluid level because of the stagnant bile. And when we look at the wall closely, we find that this is a thickened edematous wall all, all over and there is a thin layer of very cholecystic fluid around the wall that tells us that this definitely is acute cholecystitis. So here is another uh, inflamed gallbladder distended with layering of sludge and a stone. And when we search for cause of obstruction, we can find a small stone in the cystic duct. These small stones in the cystic duct, you really have to search for because the cystic duct can be tortuous. And the stones in the cystic duct might be very, very difficult to, to, to find. And sometimes we do not really uh, see the, the small stones that are ob obstructing the cystic duct. So this is a middle-aged female came with acute pain in right upper quadrant. We see a distended gallbladder. It measures almost 13 the gallbladder wall is very mildly thickened, but the gallbladder is full of ecogenic bile, telling us that this is a stagnant gallbladder. We try to find and we can't really see a, a calculus in the cystic duct. And sometimes it makes sense to see the patient again after a, a fat meal to see whether this gallbladder contracts, with, whether it, this is simply a gallbladder which has been stagnant for some time. But this gallbladder does not contract, telling us that this is a dysfunctional gallbladder, probably mostly because of a obstruction to the cystic duct. Now, what are the signs which uh, are more uh, specific for uh, acute cholecystitis? And several studies have, have looked at that. And Rallis and she found that cholelithiasis, a combination of cholelithiasis and positive sonographic Murphy sign, is, has a, a positive predictive value of around 92%. 
while a combination of cholelithiasis and thickened wall of gallbladder more than 3 mm. So, we have to look for a combination of these signs. Now, there are the acute cholecystitis, if it is not treated in time or it's not uh, operated in time, can lead to complications like empyema of gallbladder, perforation of gallbladder, gangrenous cholecystitis, and emphysematous cholecystitis. We'll see a few examples. This is a patient who is very sick with fever and severe pain in right upper quadrant, and we see a distended gallbladder with, pune, pune, pune. with stones in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is really distended. It measures around 20 centimeters with edematous walls, and it is full of ecogenic bile on ultrasound. Of course, we can't tell whether this is pus or this is simply a thick, uh, inspissated bile, but with, with the clinical uh, evidence, it tells us that we are dealing with empyema of gallbladder. And the patients who are more at risk, uh, uh, the risk factors are old age, uh, diabetes mellitus, immunocompromised patients. Then these gallbladders can perforate. So once there is a perforation, the distension might reduce. So we might actually find a normal sized or a deflated gallbladder, but the edematous walls will be visible. The breach in the wall might be visible and a small pericystic collection will always be seen. So here we find a gallbladder, which does not appear very distended. The walls appear slightly irregular and lax. And then we see a small pericystic collection here. And when we search for it, we find a small breach in the wall of the gallbladder. They are telling us that there is a perforation. Another patient here with significantly edematous walls, and we see a small breach there with a small pericolcystic abscess happening just adjacent to the gallbladder, and the color Doppler also shows inflammation of the gallbladder there. And that's the CT scan confirming that small perforation with a pericolcystic abscess. Now, advanced uh, gangrenous cholecystitis is an advanced severe type of inflammation of gallbladder defined as transmural acute inflammation resulting in necrosis or ulceration of the gallbladder wall as a result of ischemia. Because of the inflammation and distension of gallbladder, the cystic artery also gets stretched and it, 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 it stops supplying blood to the gallbladder wall which results into ischemic necrosis. Risk factors include male sex, advanced age, cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, and delayed surgery. Significantly higher morbidity and mortality rates have been reported for gangrenous cholecystitis in the range of 15 to 40 percent. So the signs that we look for are gallbladder distension with a short axis more than 4 centimeters, striated thickening of the gallbladder wall, intraluminal membranes, ecogenic debris within the gallbladder, pericolcystic fluid collections, Unfortunately, Murphy's sign is negative because this is a ischemic necrosis of the gallbladder. The gallbladder becomes insensitive and therefore that pain sign is gone. Recently, uh, Sureka and colleagues uh, uh, did a, a, a study of around 30, 30, more than 30 uh, gallbladders with gangrenous cholecystitis and they found that a combination of gallbladder distension more than 4 centimeters with intraluminal membranes and striated thickening of the gallbladder wall was a fairly sensitive uh, indicator for gangrenous cholecystitis. So what we see is thickened edematous gallbladder with striations, with separation, with membranes seen within the gallbladder lumen. The color Doppler might show vascularity within the wall, might show absence of vascularity in several areas, telling us that this is uh, a, a ischemia of the uh, of the wall. Another case here, we can see some separations floating inside the gallbladder, and we have the thickened uh, edematous gallbladder uh, wall with striations. That's the hallmark for gangrenous cholecystitis that we'll see. But remember that all gallbladder walls which are striated, which are edematous, are not gangrenous cholecystitis. We do see them in uh, certain other conditions also, particularly when you find an empty gallbladder with edematous walls without any signs of acute cholecystitis. Think of viral infections like viral hepatitis, dengue, chikungunya. They also produce a lot of gallbladder wall edema with striations in the wall, uh, and that's not gangrenous cholecystitis. Another complication is acute emphysematous cholecystitis, and that is because of a super infection of this obstructed gallbladder by gas-forming organisms. There is again a male preponderance, 
and uh, it's more frequent in diabetics and there is a very high risk of perforation. So we'll see these ecogenic foci because of the micro air bubbles within the wall and they because they are air bubbles they will produce lots of uh, reverberation artifacts. Now we must take care not to confuse this with other reverberation artifacts that we'll see with cholesterol crystals. Of course the clinical picture will be totally different in emphysematous cholecystitis but sometimes in diabetics the, uh, the, the component of clinically obvious inflammation might not be very significant and therefore you might have to take care. If there is a lot of air, you might see air within the lumen or there are a lot of air within the wall will be seen as a sheet of air, a band which produces a dirty posterior shadowing telling you that this is air, this is not something else. When the uh, 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 acute cholecystitis is not well treated, uh, it keeps happening again and again uh, resulting into chronic cholecystitis and we see two, three different uh, types of appearances in chronic cholecystitis. We'll see a traditional chronic cholecystitis. We'll see what we call as a wall eco shadow complex because of a contracted lithiasic gallbladder. We might see a porcelain gallbladder or we might see xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis. So typically the gallbladder is contracted, the walls are thickened, there are calculi within the gallbladder. Uh, so it might be a chronic quiescent cholecystitis or acute on chronic cholecystitis depending on that the, the clinical symptomatology will change but consistently we will find calculi and thickened gallbladder wall and the gallbladder might be contracted typically in chronic call. Even if you call this patient back in fasting state you will find that the gallbladder remains contracted. It does not distant physiologically that we will see. Another appearance that we sometimes see is a, a wall eco shadow complex and that is because uh, either it is a very large stone occupying whole of the space of the gallbladder or there are multiple stones packing the gallbladder so you don't identify any fluid, you don't identify the gallbladder as such and all that you see is a, a, a wall, you see a eco and you see a dense shadow behind it and that's why it is called as a wall eco shadow complex. The problem is that very often this might get mistaken for a bowel loop. The bowel loop will also full of air, distended with air will also produce a similar appearance of a wall eco shadow and you have to be careful. Diffuse calcification of the wall will result into a porcelain gallbladder. So, you will find that the wall is diffusely hyper ecogenic because of deposition of the gallbladder uh, of calcium uh, within the wall. Sometimes this calcium deposition may be spotty and you will find several spots, uh, spotty calcification all around the wall. Both uh, appearances are called as porcelain gallbladder. There is a slightly higher risk associated uh, of uh, malignancy with porcelain gallbladder and therefore we need to uh, take account of these uh, porcelain gallbladder. Uh, sometimes in chronic repeated infections, uh, example of granulometer cells might deposit into the wall producing these focal nodular areas. The wall is significantly thickened and you find this focal hypoechoic solid looking areas within the wall the lumen is compressed uh, usually the gallbladder will uh, contain uh, uh, several calculi and and the lumen is is sometimes uh, visible with some bile or some membranes inside but uh, very often the lumen might be uh, obliterated usually these hypoechoic nodular lesions uh, because they only contain uh, they are xanthogranulomas they will not show vascularity but if because of chronic inflammation some vascularity is seen then at times this might be mistaken for malignancy and you have to keep that in, in mind when we look, you look at uh, XGP of the gallbladder. Adenomyomatosis of gallbladder is another benign condition. It's uh, characterized by excessive proliferation of epithelium which goes inside the wall and produces this typical cystic areas which are called as uh, rokitansky ashkov sinuses which is the hallmark of adenomyomatosis. Uh, bile within this sinuses may concentrate, the calcium cholesterol might deposit, so you might see cholesterol crystals within these cystic areas or actual calcium might deposit and you might see some calcification within the wall. Three forms have been described, a diffuse form which affects all over the gallbladder wall or focal forms which affect only part of the wall or you might have only 
typical areas which are involved. So what you typically see on ultrasound is that the rest of the gallbladder looks normal, but in this area you find that the wall is significantly thickened and there are cystic areas within the gallbladder wall. That's the hallmark of uh, uh, adenomyomatosis. And within these cystic areas, cholesterol crystals might be seen which cause these reverberation artifacts called as cometal artifacts because they go like they produce an image like a comet. So once you see these cometal artifacts arising from within the wall of the gallbladder, that is adenomyomatosis. There is no doubt about it. And sometimes calcium might deposit and making it much more ecogenic without the artifact. So diffuse involvement might occur involving the, the gallbladder wall all around, but look at this that it is within the wall. All these ecogenic images, uh, cometal artifacts or reverberation artifacts behind them are within the wall of the gallbladder. Another example here with tiny cometal artifacts coming from the wall of the gallbladder, that is because of a diffuse uh, uh, adenomyotosis. It might involve part of the gallbladder, then it is sometimes called segmental adenomyotosis. You have this thickening of the fundal and distal body of the gallbladder with tiny uh, hypoechoic areas within the wall because of the cystic areas. Or there may be focal involvement and I have, in my practice, I see two uh, types of focal involvements. One is where the mid part of the gallbladder is involved. And therefore, it produces a, a constriction in mid part of the gallbladder. So here there is a constriction because of the thickening of the wall, producing almost an hourglass-like appearance. But when you look at that wall, you will see those characteristic uh, cystic spaces within the wall telling you that this is a hourglass gallbladder because of adenomyomatosis uh, involving mid part of the gallbladder producing a typical hourglass shape appearance. And the other form focal that I see uh, very often is a fundal adenomyotis where it involves only the fundus and you see this typically thickened wall with obliteration of the lumen but you have got cystic spaces scattered all around the, uh, the wall of the fundus of the gallbladder. If it involves the Phrygian cap then sometimes it might be missed and you really have to search for it and then you realize that oh what you see here is a Phrygian cap and you see those tiny, tiny dots within the wall telling you that this is adenomyomatosis affecting the Phrygian cap. Polypoid lesions in the gallbladder, uh, they are not very common. The, the incidence varies in different studies from 0.3 to over 95%. They are seen as elevation of the gallbladder wall that projects into the lumen. And we see three types of polypoid lesions within the gallbladder. You can have tumefactive sludge sludge balls which look like polyps or you can have pseudo polyps uh, because of deposition of cholesterol or they could be inflammatory polyps or focal adenomyomatosis or you have true polyps uh, because of adenomas, adenocarcinomas, lymphomas and metastasis. Tumefactive sludge is a precipitation of inspissated bile, multiple calculi, pigmented granules, cholesterol, crystals, hemoglobin and possible purulent bile. But it moves, it is not uh, usually not attached to the gallbladder wall. So if you ask the patient to change the posture or you tap on the on the gallbladder, the, the sludge ball will move. If there is any doubt, you can do a color doppler, it will not show vascularity. Or still, if there is any doubt, you can see the patient again the next day or after a fat meal. So this sludge ball moves when you make the patient erect, it moves down into the dependent part of the fundus. The problem comes when the, the tumefactive sludge fills the gallbladder. There is no movement uh, visible. You do a color doppler, you don't see any vascularity and you are thinking in tumefactive sludge. So you might call this patient back after a couple of days to check. The true polyps are attached to the wall. So it is non-mobile and there is no posterior acoustic shadowing. Typically we call it a ball on the wall. So that is uh, balls attached to the wall. Typically they are multiple uh, polyps, particularly the, the pseudo polyps, the cholesterol polyps uh, are multiple, they are attached to the gallbladder wall all over. So easiest thing is to make the patient erect and the stone and the sludge will move into the dependent part. The polyp will not move, it will remain attached. Only thing is that some of these polyps might have peduncles and these peduncles might be fairly flexible and these uh, pedunculated polyps might move a little but they will not go to the other end of the gallbladder like the stones will do so it's not very difficult to differentiate. 
The cholesterol polyps will contain cholesterol crystals and they will usually produce a reverberation artifact that uh, produces a comatal artifact behind these cholesterol crystals. So we are able to identify them. Uh, this was a patient known to have gallbladder calculi, two, three attacks of cholecystitis in the past. And then what we see is there are stones, but there is a polyp, which turned out to be an inflammatory polyp. The inflammatory polyps have a non-specific appearance. Usually there is a ST of cholecystitis and there usually are stones present. Adenomatous polyps are rare, accounting for about 4 to 7 percent of all GB polyps. Typically, incidentally found lesions, more common in patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis or GI polyposis syndromes. Size varies from few millimeters to 20 millimeters, may show internal vascularity, may be pedunculated or sessile. And typically, they are solitary. So, this is what we call the ball on the wall appearance of a solitary adenomatous polyp. It does not move on change of posture. The size can vary. There have been uh, case reports where uh, sizes almost up to 20 millimeters uh, have been recorded for the simple adenomatous polyps. The European Society of Gastroenterology and Abdominal Radiology uh, collaborated with uh, other uh, international associations to use joint guidelines once you see a polyp. But still, there is no final answer. The key points of their study published in 2017 was that management of gallbladder polyps is contentious. Cholecystectomy is recommended for gallbladder polyps more than 10 millimeters. Although this is an arbitrary size, there are no conclusive studies to tell that more than 10 millimeters is definitely malignant. Management of polyps less than 10 millimeters depends on patient and polyp characteristics, and they have identified certain risk factors. That if the age is more than 50, if there is history of PSC, Indian ethnicity, particularly we have seen that in North Indians, the incidence of uh, uh, gallbladder carcinoma is fairly high and therefore we are a little worried about polyps in that population. I think probably in some of the East Asian populations also the same thing will apply. A sessile polyp or when you find that the gallbladder wall is thickened at the base of the polyp, it is more than 4 millimeters. That is also a fairly significant sign which tells us that this polyp is more likely to be a malignant polyp. And they have produced a, 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 a flow chart to follow in case of uh, 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 polyps to how, to how to find them. Gallbladder neoplasms most commonly are adenocarcinomas. They are full focal ill-defined masses replacing the gallbladder, focal or diffuse gallbladder wall thickening intraluminal polypoid masses. And you see that uh, usually you will find that the gallbladder wall at the base of the polyp is fairly thickened and the tumor has infiltrated into the gallbladder neck and here or there are the uh, uh, lymph nodes in the, uh, the portal region. Here is another polyp, but look at the gallbladder wall, significantly thickened gallbladder wall for me. It is a very significant sign to identify a benign polyp from a malignant polyp. Rarely you might have uh, malignancy uh, polyps which look multiple or polyps which are spread around the wall and then the diagnosis is not very difficult. When you see a diffusely thickened wall, then uh, uh, diagnosis is more difficult. But if you find a wall which is more than 8 millimeters thickened, which shows vascularity with, without signs of uh, acute cholecystitis, think of gallbladder carcinoma. Unfortunately, a lot of gallbladder cancers, they are silent cancers. They keep spreading and the patient only presents very late, like this 58-year-old presented with hepatomegaly. And when we see, examine them, we find that this gallbladder tumor is already uh, extended to the right lobe of liver and extended. Uh, another patient here, the gallbladder tumor is already extended to the hepatic hilum and involved the duodenum uh, there. So they spread, they are silent uh, tumors and they will present very, very late as lumps in the right upper uh, quadrant or when they spread to the hepatic hilum and obstruct the, the bile duct and then you will, they will present as uh, obstructive jaundice. So gallbladder cancer is, is still remains a, a problem uh, for detection. So I'll conclude by saying that ultrasound is the investigation of choice for gallbladder pathology. Examination should preferably be done in fasting state. In case of doubtful fast, uh, findings, always examine the patient by changing the, the posture. And uh, 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 it, it might sometimes make sense to see the patient again the next day or uh, to call the patient uh, in, in a, a post-fat meal for, to see whether the gallbladder is called.
I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, let us have the, the first question for the poll. And while they uh, are taking the questions and uh, uh, let me check what questions have come from the uh, audience. Uh, one question is that ecogenic foci added into the box River artifacts and how to differentiate between a cholesterol stone and uh, adenomyosis. What you have to do is, if you are in doubt, uh, use a high frequency probe, uh, get a high resolution probe because you need to differentiate whether the source of this comatal artifact is within the wall or it is within the lumen of the gallbladder. If it is within the wall, we know that this is adenomyosis, this uh, cannot be uh, stones in the gallbladder. Uh, how can we diagnose non-functioning gallbladder? The only way to diagnose non-functioning gallbladder is to, do, to check the gallbladder after a fat meal. Uh, I, I, other simpler way of uh, looking at gallbladder function. So, are we ready with the with the poll, Rishi? Are we ready with the poll? Yeah, so acute cholecystitis following signs may be seen except and everybody has answered correctly that in acute cholecystitis the gallbladder is distended because most often it is an obstructed gallbladder and therefore you don't see contracted gallbladder in acute cholecystitis. That's correct answer. So till they get the second um, poll, I might look at what questions have come in. <coughs> and there is one question, uh, can gallbladder wall thickening occur only on one side? Uh, if it is uh, because of malignancy, then it can occur only on one side. Inflammatory gallbladder wall thickening will involve the gallbladder wall diffusely. Adenomyomatosis will uh, either be diffuse or focal. So it usually doesn't happen only on one side. It usually, even the focal adenomyomatosis, which uh, produces our glass gallbladder, involves the gallbladder circumferentially. So if it is involving only on one side, it usually is uh, uh, a, a neoplastic process, which is. Why there is sludge or ecogenic material in gallbladder after prolonged fasting? That is because the gallbladder has not been functioning. It is a stagnant gallbladder. It is not a non. It is a non-obstructed gallbladder, but because it has not emptied, therefore it the gall the bile becomes ecogenic. That's the cause why you see ecogenic bile within a stagnant gallbladder. In the gallbladder of patient, typically patients who are on oral, uh, who are not on oral feeds, who are on parenteral uh, supplementation, their gallbladders you will very often see ecogenic part. All right, here we have uh, which of these features differentiate benign from malignant polyp, and uh, forty percent have correctly guessed that it is the thickened adjacent wall. The sessile polyp, single polyp, vascularity, all features can be seen in benign polyps as well. You don't see them in, in malignant polyps. So, uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Let us move on to the next uh, topic. And our uh, next speaker is uh, none other than uh, Professor Won J. Lee. And he is going to talk on contrast enhanced ultrasound of liver uh, and update. Uh, professor Lee is uh, from Seoul, uh, Korea. He is a professor at uh, Department of Radiology, Samsung Medical Center, Sung Kyun Won University in Seoul. He has done his MD and PhD from Seoul National University. He uh, has been the Secretary General of Korean Society of Radiology from 2015 to 18. He has been a President of Korean Society of Abdominal Radiology from 2015 to 16. 
and he was chairman of the board of directors of Korean Society of Ultrasound in Medicine from 2016 to 2018, and he was the president of AFSAM from 2018 to 2022. So welcome, uh, Professor Wonchelli. Uh, he's going to talk on CU, CUS of liver. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gohale, for your kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to join this afternoon G webinar. I'd like to extend my appreciation to Dr. Gohale for his effort to prepare this webinar. Uh, this webinar is a new trial for AFSUM to expand our education program by online, especially under the pandemic uh, circumstances. I hope every participant here enjoy the webinar and have a fruitful time. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, Sorry. Um, Dr. Wang, can you stop and again share? I'm sorry? Can you stop and again share? Okay. So, Dr. Wan, we are going to share the PPT from here. Okay, please, please. Yeah, upload my. Yep. Whenever you want to change the PPT, just say next slide. Okay. I don't have to say next, I think. Uh, please, uh, upload my slide, please. Ah, okay. Dr. Wan, can you see that? Yes, I can see. So, do you hear? Do you hear the my my talk? Yes. Uh, please uh, start speaking. Okay. Uh, Doesn't. She please uh, go back to the first slide and stop speaking. Uh, okay, please uh, show me the first slide, please. First slide, please. And okay, uh, I uh, okay, I might. Um, I'd like to talk about the update in the contrast in ultrasound of the liver. Next slide, please. Next, please. My talk consists of the introduction, K 
characterization of hepatic tumors, guidance for interventional procedures, and other publications and summary. Next slide, please. Uh, the first generation ultrasound contrast agent is not currently available because it was a very fragile air bubble, and we use the ultrasound of a high mechanical index. So ultrasound signal emitted from these micro bubbles, which called the harmonic signal, were generated by micro bubble disruption. So we had to perform intermittent scanning because we had to wait until the mi micro bubbles were refilled into the liver once the micro bubbles were disrupted during its scanning. So it was technically difficult to obtain good images. So the only first generation ultrasound contrast agent Levovist was not produced Wait, anymore well, from Bayer. Yeah, <laughs> However, when Levovist enhanced ultrasound imaging was successfully obtained, it was usually very nice because harmonic signals generated by microbubble disruption was so strong. Next, uh, the second generation ultrasound contrast agent are composed of inert gas. Okay. Inert gas and shell, and so they are not so fragile, and harmonic signals are generated by microbubble oscillation, not disruption, under low mechanical index. So we don't have to wait until the microbubbles are refilled into the liver, so we can obtain the real-time uh, continuous scanning, and it is technically easy to obtain the images. There are several available second generation ultrasound contrast agents like this, Sonoview, Optizone, Definite, and Sonajoy. Uh, this slide shows more detail about the second generation ultrasound contrast agent. They consist of a um, small sphere of inert gas and phospholipid gel with a 2 to 3 micrometers of a diameter. Inert gas like sulfide uh, hexafluoride, the furfurol, uh, butane and propane is filled in the center. Out shell consists of a phospholipid chain and the bondage between phospholipids prevents its breakdown and improves its stability. Uh, let me introduce the mechanism of acoustic emission from ultrasound contrast agent. The response of ultrasound contrast agent is variable under the different acoustic pressure. Under the low acoustic pressure, uh, micro bubbles generate linear backscattered signal, which is not physical. When the acoustic pressure increases around 50 to 100 kilopascal, which is in low mechanical index range, micro bubbles oscillate uh, and generate non linear backscattering, which is a harmonic signal. If the pressure increases extremely around 500 kilopascal, uh, which is a high mechanical index range, microbubble disrupt and generate a strong harmonic signal. Ultrasound machines that installed harmonic imaging technology can detect second generation, uh, second harmonic signals and make uh, ultrasound using second harmonic signal. Next slide, please. Uh, doctor, can you switch on the camera? We can't see you. I'm sorry. Uh, doctor, can you switch on the camera? Me? So, this slide shows um, in vivo kinetics of ultrasound contrast agent. We can observe um, those, um, um, We can observe the harmonic signals from the first generation ultrasound contrast agent Levovist for a short, uh, short period after the contrast injection. We can observe the harmonic signals from the second generation ultrasound contrast agent for a longer uh, period like this. Uh, anyway, we call this period as a vascular phase because micro bubbles are located uh, in the vascular uh, in, located in, in the vascular space during this period, and so the harmonic signals. Okay. Mm. Uh, this table shows the time interval of these four phases at, uh, after contrast injection according to recent Wolfram guideline 20, 2020. 
the arterial phase uh, starts at what, 1 to 20 seconds and uh, 30 to 45. Polar venous phase 30 to starts 40, uh, 30 to 45 and ends um, at 120 seconds. A late phase uh, starts uh, over 120 seconds and ends. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Post vascular phase imaging is made by phagocytosis of microbulbous by the Cooper cells. Uh, this mechanism is similar to SPIO for MR imaging. Sonazoid is taken up by the Cooper cells after 10 minutes uh, following the contrast injection. During the Cooper phase, we can see a defective area in the malignant hepatic lesions because there are no Cooper cells in these lesions. Therefore, this function increases the sensitivity in detecting malignant hepatic lesion. Okay. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, currently, only the second generation of contra ultrasound contrast agents are available. We usually use low mechanical index contrast imaging, which is a real time continuous scanning technique uh, using low power ultrasound around 0.2 to 0.5 megapascal so the transmitted ultrasound can oscillate microbubbles and generate non-linear backscattering harmonic signal. Next slide, please. <laughs> Recently, Afsum published the contrastional ultrasound guideline regarding sonazoid in ultrasound and the journal of medical ultrasound together. Here, the low mechanical uh, index contrast imaging was also described as a usual imaging technique. Additionally, uh, high mechanical index contrast imaging and low mechanical index harmonic imaging using sonazoid were introduced as an alternative imaging techniques, which are mostly used in Japan. Next slide, please. Uh, the first application is a characterization of hepatic tumors. Next, please. Uh, let me introduce on the imaging diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. According to the 2011 AASLD guideline, hepatocellular carcinoma can be diagnosed uh, on, uh, only with the imaging studies. If a nodule is larger than one centimeter in serotic liver and it shows typical findings, arterial hypervascularity and venous or delayed washout on full face MDCT or dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, we can diagnose it as a HCC. Next slide, please. Uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound diagnosis of HCC is still a changing, challenging issue. Uh, in the recent 2011 AASLD guideline, the EUS is deleted from the guideline. Here, it is because the CUS finding of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is sometimes similar to HCC in the enhancement pattern. Um, However, some researchers have not agreed with this guideline. Uh, they said, for example, the number of patients who showed the same enhancement pattern was too small. Uh, moreover, five of these 10 patients showed early washout before 60 seconds, so we could diagnose they were not HCC. Next slide, please. AASLD 2018 introduced the LILAS firstly as a criteria for imaging diagnosis of HCC. The other countries worldwide started to use the LILAS as well. As you see here, if a tumor is classified as a LR5, as CT or MRI, it can be diagnosed as, uh, it can be confirmed as HCC. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the detail of LILAS. If a tumor greater than one centimeter is showing a non-rim arterial enhancement, with these major features such as enhancing, now, enhancing capsule, non-peripheral washout, and threshold growth at CT or MRI, it can be diagnosed as HCC. But contrast enhanced ultrasound was not included here as a diagnostic imaging modality. Next slide. Um, uh, though AASLD did not include uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound as a diagnostic imaging modality, AASLD also developed C EUS LILAS here, uh, late and mild washout was used as a major feature of CUS LILAS LR5. Next slide. 
Um, this slide shows typical contrast and ultrasound imaging findings of hepatic cellular carcinoma. Uh, CT and the CEUS shows the same arterial enhancement and the delayed washout. Uh, this image shows strong harmonic signals because we use a lab based in this case. Uh, please click here, here please. Uh, this case is a typical HCC. We can see a homogeneous, homogeneous enhancement at 20 seconds. And you can please here, okay. Uh, please here, click here, please. Uh, you can see also see late, again, please, late mild washout in, on the first one minute delayed images. So this region can be classified as LR5, definite HCC. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows sonazole enhanced ultrasound of an inconspicuous HCC. These are fusion imaging images with ultrasound MRI. A tiny HCC is located behind the hepatic vein here on the MRI, but you cannot see the region on the pre-contrast ultrasound here. Uh, arterial phase, please again here. Here, arterial phase shows an enhancing nodule behind the hepatic vein. Uh, again here. Again, uh, inconspicuous in the polar phase, but. We, here, but uh, we can see washout of the lesion clearly on the copper face here. Copper face. As you see, the harmonic signals from sonogen enhanced ultrasound is not so strong like a level based, but we can see the lesion easily and continuously. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a 64 year old man with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. It is not difficult to diagnose intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with this MR imaging. Anyway, RTR phase shows slow peripheral washout, uh, slow peripheral enhancement in the mass here. Um, polar phase, uh, polar venous phase shows early and definite washout and late. Late phase, 30 minutes delayed as we can see uh, the definite was here. Okay. As you, as you know, metastasis from colon cancer is not enhancing in the arterial phase at CT, but we can see very early arterial enhancement at ultrasound, contrast enhanced ultrasound. According to this study, 88% of metastasis showed the arterial enhancement. Their enhancement patterns were rim in 42% and diffuse in 58%. Peak arterial enhancement was 15 seconds in average, and beginning of a washout was 25 seconds. Uniform complete washout occurred in 100% during the polar phase. Okay, this means transient arterial hypervascularity followed by rapid and complete washout in the CEUS is completed within the conventional arterial phase at CT. Next slide, please. A 72-year-old man with gold blood cancer and hepatic metastasis. As mentioned before, hepatic metastasis shows early arterial enhancement and early washout. Again, please. Here, here. One minute polar phase image shows more clearly washout here and here. Okay, next please. Early washout is a characteristic non-HCC malignancy. This is a 63-year-old woman with a metastasis from gallbladder cancer. You can see enhancement of the tumor on the arterial face and the washout is following at 20 seconds. This finding usually appears in the metastasis or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma rather than HCC. Early washout less than 60 seconds is also used as criteria for CEUS LRM, which means malignant but not HCC specific in the in the CEUS LILAS. Next, please. This is a uh, focal nodular hyperplasia case using sonazoid. Uh, please. First, uh, uh, during the arterial phase, we can see an enhancing nodule with a central feeding artery, but from the polar phase, delayed phase, 
And Kufa Fels, we can see the region is Aisoe Koi. We can see the uh, enhancing region, but other base uh, is Aisoe Koi. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this is an another case of a focal nodal hyperplasia showing characteristic hemodynamic features. Uh, central feeding artery, centrifugal enhancement, so called spoke wheel pattern, and I saw echogenicity on the Kupfer face imaging. Homogen uh, spoke wheel pattern, uh, centrifugal enhancement uh, is a characteristic finding of arterial face, and the uh, uh, Kupfer face is uh, it shows I saw echogenicity. So when we can see th uh, these findings, we can diagnose it as FNH. Next, please. Okay, uh, this is a, a case of a hepatic adenoma using sonazoid. We can please click this one. Uh, we can see a large enhancing mass in the arterial face. We also can see the arterial supply from the surface into the mass. We can call this a basket pattern. Most tumor like HCC and adenoma shows this kind of enhancement pattern, basket pattern. So if we see the basic pattern, Clinical situation is important to differentiate them. Uh, the mass, uh, please click here. Uh, the, uh, the mass is isoechoic from the polar phase, 30 minutes late phase, uh, copper phase. Uh, it shows isoechogenicity. Next slide, please. Next, please. As you know, hepatic hemangioma has three types of enhancement pattern. Type 1 is peripheral, globular, and centrally fetal fill in pattern. Type 2 is a strong and rapid enhancement throughout three phases. Type 3 is no or minimal enhancement like bright dot or delayed obliteration throughout three phases. Next slide, please. Uh, CEUS can demonstrate the same enhancement pattern like this peripheral globular and centrally fetal fill in pattern. A strong rapid enhancement throughout three phases. We call this as a high flow type. Minimal enhancement like bright dot or delayed obliteration throughout three phases. We call this as a slow flow type. Next, please. Uh, this is a hemangioma case using sonazoid. We can see peripheral, please click, okay. You can see a peripheral globular enhancement in the arterial phase, which becomes homogeneous here. Homogeneous. during the portal phase and equilibrium phase. It, it finally becomes to be slightly hypoechoic. In the copper phase, hemangiomas become to be iso or hypoechoic relative to surrounding liver in the copper phase. Next, please. Homogeneous, slightly hypoechoic. Okay. Uh, CUS is also used for ultrasound guidance of interventional procedure. It is useful to perform planning ultrasound to evaluate the feasibility for RF population and biopsy. And it is also useful to perform RF population. Before revelation, we can obtain confirmative diagnosis of HCC. Moreover, a copper phase of a CUS can help targeting for RF population biopsy. Next, please. Here is a sub-centimeter HCC in the, in the lateral segment. We can see the tiny enhancing nodule in the arterial phase. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, then we uh, injected Injected uh, somazoid, we can it could confirm the exact location, <laughs> and we could uh, perform RF operation so, uh, successfully. Next, please. Uh, uh, this is a, another case of inconspicuous HCC. As you see here, the lesion is still suspicious uh, in the copper phase after the first injection of somazoid. After second injection, we can see the arterial enhancement and the delayed washout more clearly. So we can perform RF fibrillation with the so-called leaf fusion techniques uh, successfully. Next slide, please. 
We can apply CUS to other liver diseases like this. Here I'll explain about the post-transplanted liver. Other applications are still under investigation. Next, please. Uh, when, when we performed a right lobe living donor liver transplantation, middle lobe hepatic venous tributary can be reconstructed for drainage of the right anterior segment of the transplanted liver. If the uh, middle hepatic venous tributary are occluded, the involved, uh, involved territory in the right anterior segment becomes hyperemic from arterial flow as a compensatory process of decreased portal venous inflow, but peak parenchyma enhancement of the involved territory decreases compared to the involved segment. Next slide. Uh, this is a typical case of hepatic venous obstruction at the enter position vein graft. The U.S. shows arterial hyperemia in the right anterior segment and the decreased peak parenchymal enhancement of the involved segment compared to the normal parenchyma. This area. Okay. Next, please. This is a case of hepatic arterial occlusion. Doppler ultrasound study couldn't detect the arterial flows, so we performed the CUS as the next step. Uh, arterial phase shows only foral venous flow at 13 seconds without arterial flow. No, only foral flow. So we recommend a surgical revision to our surgeon. Uh, please here, click here, please. After revision of hepatic artery, we can uh, arterial hepatic arteries. Please, please click here. Second, uh, hepatic artery is normally opacified with micro bubbles before the foral venous flow arrives. Okay, uh, this patient has a large amount of ascites after the liver uh, transplantation. We can see the contrast enhanced leak out from the liver. It means uh, hepatic artery bleeding. Okay. Next, please. In summary, contrast enhanced ultrasound is useful for characterizing hepatic tumors, guiding interventional procedures, and evaluating vascular compromises in patients with liver disease. Sonazoid had some additional advantages over the other second generation ultrasound contrast agent. Thank you for your attention. And now let's have some couple of uh, questions. Next. Uh, which one of the following has an additional phase, so-called the Cooper phase, following the vascular phase on the contrast and the ultrasound? Number one, son of you. Number two, definite. Number three, Levovist. And number four, Sonazoid. So till uh, the back office runs the poll, uh, let's uh, see if the uh, audience has some questions for you. Uh, Lee. One question that uh, has come in is, uh, what is your experience uh, with uh, inflammatory lesions, uh, particularly uh, uh, with uh, fungal lesions? Do you have any typical uh, um, contrast uh, appearances? Actually, okay, thank you for your uh, question. Um, uh, usually, okay. Uh, we have uh, some indications, so uh, uh, only uh, we use for characterization of hepatic tumors and all uh, guidance for interventional procedures. So uh, whenever we use uh, to characterize tumors, it is always uh, uh, it's already confirmed as some kind of hepatic tumors, not, impl not inflammation. Then uh, okay. we uh, use CUS to differentiate the HCC, adenoma, FA, something like that. So we uh, usually uh, uh, we uh, we don't use uh, when we need uh, 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 suspect a lesion which uh, could be uh, inflammation. All right. So we had uh, the poll, and most of them have answered sonozoid <laughs> as uh, the answer for the first question. Yes, it, uh, answer is sonozoid. Yeah. Number so four. Let us have uh, the uh, next uh, second question. Uh, I can see the second question. 
let, let, let's see. They, they must be running the poll for the audience and um, we will have the, the next question ready. Second so, question is which kind, uh, which of the following? Question, one question is that generally speaking in general practice if you on ultrasound come across a focal liver lesion would you rather advise a CEUS or a CT? Oh, uh, if uh, when you detect a hepatic tumors, we first Incident do CT. Oh, okay. CT oh, first. Here is the second then, question. Which one of the... Which shows the scope pattern is number three. For color nodular hyperplasia is the correct answer. Number three, uh, FNH is the correct answer. Have, uh, answered correctly, 60% so thank you very much, Hello. Professor Lee, for that nice talk on CUS. And let us move on to the next uh, thank you very much. talk on the agenda. And uh, the next speaker uh, uh, to this afternoon is uh, Dr. Nitin Chawal from Mumbai. And he is going to talk on ultrasound of uh, uh, pancreas. Dr. Nitin Chobal is a uh, consultant in ultrasound at the Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai. He is also a professor of radiology at D.Y. Patil University, Mumbai. He is a past president of IFUNB. He has published more than 100 papers in national and international peer-reviewed journals. He has delivered several prestigious orations and lectures in national and international conferences. Recently, he has co-authored the WFUMB guidelines for CEUS. He has contributed chapters to several books. He is a fellow of ICRI, ICMU, AIUM, and SRU. And uh, most of us in India um, uh, listen to Nitin Chawal whenever and wherever he is speaking. So Nitin is going to talk on uh, ultrasound of pancreas. Over to you, Nitin. Yeah. Thank you, Sudhir, so much. And, uh... Uh, thank you for this invite as well. So, uh, screen not yet. Can you see my screen? Not yet. So the share button it doesn't is not enabled. At the top. At the top of the screen. At the top of the so screen. Can you click on uh, share share screen? No, it's not, it's not. Share screen is at the top of the screen. Just above. It is enabled. It's not enabled. Four, four, four. Sir, we'll share it from our side. Uh, okay. But just try once uh, because. Uh, Sir, we are sharing from our side. Okay. Yeah, so can you see the slides? Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, you are running the slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, the uh, only thing is now. Okay. Okay, fine. So, thank you so much again uh, for this invite. And uh, 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 Sudhir, thank you for organizing and taking all the efforts this afternoon. So can we go to the next one? So, in day-to-day -day practice, this is what happens. We start uh, in the morning and then... Uh, we have this tough patient who is obese, there is a lot of gaseous distension all over and therefore uh, it's very difficult to see the pancreas and then it's uh, very often in most of the days, uh, most of the times it's a real challenge. But we can, next please, but we can overcome, next please, next slide, next slide. So we can overcome this by uh, certain tricks, for example, uh, we can ask the patient, can, I, can you see my arrow? Uh, uh, see, uh, ask the patient to take some water. Uh, yeah, uh, then we can uh, do a mild. Call. No, no, that's the wrong thing. Anyway, uh, I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable this way. Can I try sharing the screen again? Okay. Anyway, so we'll continue. So, or we can ask. Uh, we can ask, use the liver as an acoustic window. Sometimes you can use the spleen as an acoustic window, and uh, or sometimes, of course, you can turn the patient in a decubitus position and try and see the pancreas. Go to the next one, please. Next. Uh, okay, uh, sometimes you might have to make the patient sit uh, yeah, and uh, look at the pancreas in a sitting position. Uh, sometimes, of course, the breath holding is variable. 
you might have to ask him to take a deep breath in or you might ask you to breathe out sometimes you might ask them to bloat the stomach so that's uh, variable depending upon the patient next please you have to go a little faster because the presentation is long so uh, basically uh, but most of the days nowadays we are able to look at the pancreas very well uh, we can see the head of the pancreas the body of the pancreas and the tail of the pancreas very well can i try sharing the screen again once yes sir yes sir yeah. you better share it here yeah. i'll be more comfortable with this one yeah i know but again uh, ah there we are there we are yes yeah, sir click on share screen yeah okay. yeah can you share the yeah, perfect can you maximize the screen the uh, ppt yeah. okay perfect perfect thank you sir i'm sorry for this but i will be more comfortable this way okay so uh, the, that's right so uh, when you look at pancreas the vascularity around the pancreas is very very important uh, so for this is for couple of reasons one is that uh, the vessels help us in identifying the pancreas uh, for example we use a splenic vein to look at the entire pancreas we use the uh, superior mesenteric vein and the ivc to identify the unseen portion of pancreas use the gastroduodenal artery to differentiate the head of the pancreas from rest of the pancreas also the vessels are very important from the point of your pathology for example in acute pancreatitis you can get splenic vein thrombosis and most important in the ca pancreas we need to find out if the vessels are involved because that can differentiate a resectable tumor from a non resectable tumor so vessels around the pancreas are very important in most of the patients now with good machines we are able to see the duct of the pancreas which typically is in the range of about maximum 3 mm the appearance of the pancreas depends is variable in a young pancreas what we see is an ecopore pancreas but generally with age you might see a slight increase in the refractivity of the pancreas then of course we have fatty pancreas typically seen in diabetic old patients sometimes diseases like cystic fibrosis etc uh, this was a very interesting case this patient had uh, a focal hyperreflective area in the head of the pancreas and therefore we did an mr and mr said there is no lesion but this is a focal cartil change in the pancreas and now this patient has two focal hyperreflective areas so we know very well that we can have focal fatty infiltration in pancreas just like in liver but we need to separate them out from tumors typically we would ask for an mri Uh, fat suppression mri to confirm that it is fat so the most common pathology we see in day to day practice is acute pancreatitis uh, the clinician wants us to rule out other causes diagnose acute pancreatitis find out if there is an associated gall bladder disease chase the disease follow up and pick up complications so very often acute pancreatitis and acute cholecystitis mimic each other and therefore we need to rule out things like acute cholecystitis and anything which gives us to pain in the epigastric lesion radiating to the back again we have to consider as a differential diagnosis for example dissection uh, aortic aneurysm with dissection also can present with pain in the upper abdomen radiating to the back or for that matter this was a very interesting case a middle aged person who came with acute pain in abdomen and what we saw was a superior mesenteric artery dissection so that's a flap within the superior mesenteric artery that's a dissection in the superior mesenteric artery which is of course rare but he presented as acute pain in abdomen radiating to the back so everyone thought that he has got pancreatitis so this is very important but of course then we can diagnose pancreatitis uh, we have various signs which have been described uh, the prevalence of these uh, signs is variable so the most common things which we just are basically an enlargement of the gland decreased reflectivity of the gland a prominent pancreatic duct and indistinct ventral margin of the pancreas very often we see peripancreatic inflammation which can come up in the form of small fluids or very often nowadays we can see peri fat stranding as well or sometimes the pancreas can be just heterogeneous without being ecopore as such we do see focal pancreatitis typically in the head of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas but it is very important to rule out focal pancreatitis from a tumor but most of the time the clinical presentation is quite different for both the situations the very often the question asked is can we diagnose necrotizing pancreatitis on ultrasound and now with contrast the answer is yes we can differentiate uh, interstitial pancreatitis from necrotizing pancreatitis but typically even on a b mode 
When you see a pancreas which is quite heterogeneous with eco pore areas with associated peripancreatic pen, 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 fluid with an internal echoes, complications like superior uh, splenic vein thrombosis, one should think of a necrotizing pancreatitis. Then, of course, with acute pancreatitis, you can have acute cholecystitis. With acute pancreatitis, most often the surgeon also wants to know, uh, find out the cause, which could be a common bile duct calculus or a biliary disease. Here, for example, patient has an obstructive jaundice, intrapatic dilatation, gallbladder stones, CBD stones, and an acute pancreatitis. So we know from experience that alcohol and gallstones constitute the most important causes of acute pancreatitis, and in about 10% or 20%, we could have other causes also. Sometimes you might be able to pinpoint the cause, cause of acute pancreatitis. For example, in autoimmune pancreatitis, we have a huge pancreas which looks like a sausage, and this is very often uh, referred to as a sausage shaped pancreas. And very often we might get tiny calcifications within the pancreas, which is very typical of autoimmune pancreatitis. But there are limitations. First of all, gaseous distension, paralytic ideas can limit in examination. It might be very difficult on ultrasound to pick up the spread of the disease, but we can make an attempt. And of course, necrotizing pancreatitis, nowadays we do contrast, but that was a limitation. So once you have pancreatitis, it can spread virtually anywhere. It can go into the lesser sac, it can go into the transverse mesocolon, it can go into the bowel mail, mesentery, it can go into the duodenum, etc. So here, for example, we have a patient, he's got acute pancreatitis, there's peripancreatic fluid, there's fluid around the liver, there is fluid in the peristhenic area, there is fluid in the paracolic gutter, there is fluid in the peris, uh, perinephric area, left neural effusion. So for all practical purposes, he's got a, a fluid all over the abdomen, which can nowadays be picked up on ultrasound, but CT is definitely better because you get a whole perspective. Clinically, pancreatitis can vary. Patients can be fine sometimes uh, uh, within a few days, but sometimes they have a very morbid course. They can land up with multi-organ failure also. Ultrasound is also very useful in picking up complications and most important, following up uh, complications. The most important thing which everyone wants to know is fluid collections around the pancreas following pancreatitis. So typically, this is a CT classification. Uh, but we can use it in ultrasound also. So it all depends upon whether the pancreatitis is interstitial pancreatitis or necrosis, and it all depends upon when you see the fluid, before few weeks or after four weeks. So classically, in an interstitial pancreatitis, when you get a fluid collection, it is known as acute peripancreatic fluid collection or APFC. Typically, the margins are ill-defined, but there are no internal echoes within the fluid. Whereas in a necrotizing pancreatitis, when you have fluid, very often you get uh, margins which are again ill-defined, but you get debris within the fluid or you get ill-defined ecogenic areas within the fluid, which is typical of ACN. And in pseudosis, which typically comes in interstitial pancreatitis, after four weeks, we have a well-defined wall. Very often we might see fine debris within it, which is a normal finding. But of course, if the debris are more, we should think of infection. And then typically in the world of necrosis, which is seen in necrotizing pancreatitis after four weeks, we see a lot of debris and irregular wall, which is diagnostic very often of one, and especially when you know that this patient already had a necrotizing pancreatitis. So ultrasound can actually differentiate between the different types of fluid collections. But remember that whenever the fluid around the pancreas, irrespective of the type of pancreatitis, irrespective of uh, what, uh, when the fluid comes, when the fluid has debris, when the fluid has ecogenic areas, always think of infection or an abscess, especially the counts of the patient are in favor of that. And we can always aspirate this fluid and find out whether it is clear or it is infected or no. And then, of course, we can do aspirations of fluid in the peripancreatic area. Uh, we can uh, uh, do aspiration. We can uh, put in a pigtail uh, so that uh, if there is a repeated fluid collection, that can be drained very well. Uh, these, again, have problems like infection, but this can be done very easily under ultrasound guidance. Nowadays, of course, uh, what they do very often is do endoscopy and then put a stent between the stomach and the pseudocyst or the collection within the pancreas. Or this was a patient who had necrotizing pancreatitis, so they did a uh, removal of entire necrosis, and now he's got some fluid around the pancreas, and they have done a gastrocystostomy uh, for this particular fluid collection. Then we can have acute and chronic pancreatitis. Here's a patient who's got typical calcifications all over the pancreas. There's ductal dilatation. And at the top, now he's got acute inflammation in the form of an ecopore areas and fluid collection. So uh, whenever a patient has chronic uh, pancreatitis, 
and comes with acute pain, we need to think of acute on chronic pancreatitis. So, in chronic pancreatitis, again, we have classical features, but the two most important diagnostic features of chronic pancreatitis are dilatation of the duct, calcifications within the pancreas, and calculi within the dilated duct, and of course, atrophy of the gland. So very often in chronic pancreatitis, we see that the rest of the gland is quite uh, echogenic and small in size, for example, here. And of course, here we have calcifications. Now, it is very important to differentiate calcifications within the parenchyma of the pancreas from calcula within the pancreatic duct. And this is important from the point of view of management. So very often what we do is use volumetric ultrasound, delineate the pancreatic duct and pick up the calcula and make sure that they are within the duct and not outside. So here's an so just like in a fetus, we do sweeps and we do walkthroughs. We can walk through the pancreatic duct or the common bell duct and find out whether the calcula are within the duct or within the parenchyma. This is very important from the point of view of management because when there are calcula within the duct, the surgeons can put a stent within the duct and then uh, make sure that there is good flow of bile from the pancreas outside. But one of the most common problems which we encounter in practice is differentiating a mass, inflammatory mass associated in chronic pancreatitis from neoplasm and this can be sometimes very tricky because both are hypoechoic. In both you can get duct dilatation but calcification is more common in mass forming pancreatitis as opposed to adenocarcinomas and contrast enhanced ultrasound plays a very very important role because when you have an adenocarcinoma you have hypo enhancement Whereas when you have a mass forming pancreatitis, you have iso enhancement in all the phases. So contrast is playing a big role. I'll come to contrast at the end of this talk. It's very important in pancreas nowadays. Pancreatic carcinoma, fairly common carcinoma. I would say very often missed clinically as well as on ultrasound. But remember that you can present to a sonologist in any way. Patients could just walk in or symptomatic for a health checkup. We have picked up that. Patient can come with jaundice. Patient can come with weight loss or can have endocrine manifestation if it is an endocrine secreting tumor. So the presentation can be variable. Most of them are in the head, 75%, 15% in the body and 10% in the tail of the pancreas. So that's very important to remember. So masses, when they are in the head of the pancreas, in a way, fortunately present early because these patients tend to be symptomatic. They could get itching, they could get jaundice and here for example we have a intrahepatic dilatation, CBD dilatation and a mass in the head of the pancreas. So it is first picked up quite early. Now very often when you have a mass in the head of the pancreas or when you have this double duct sign, that means double barrier sign, you have a CBD dilatation and a pancreatic dilatation, we need to think of periampedular neoplasms besides the C head of the pancreas. So we know that all the neoplasms in that area, the ampullary neoplasm, neoplasm coming from bile duct, Neoplasm coming from duodenum or CA head of the pancreas can all manifest as dilated pancreatic duct and a dilated CBD. Very often on ultrasound it is very difficult and you have to do more tests like CT, MR, endoscopic ultrasound etc. depending upon the situation. But this is a common thing which we present, the periampullary neoplasms. Sometimes it is very difficult to pinpoint the exact lesion. But these are just examples of CA head of the pancreas. They can be variable in terms of ecogenicity. They can be variable in terms of their appearances. This is a very large one, of course, uh, in the head of the pancreas. This one again is a, a mass which is seen in the head and the unseen process. Common bile duct dilated, pancreatic duct dilated also. This was a relatively young female. That's a lesion in the unseen process. So I was trying to tell you that uh, the vessels are very important uh, in identifying the anatomy of the pancreas. So typically when you want to look at lesions in unseen process, always go between the SMD and the IVC in a longitudinal plane. And this was taught to us many years back by Dr. David Cosgrove when he used to come for a process. That unseen process is seen better on longitudinal. When it comes to tail of the pancreas and body of the pancreas, it is very often a catastrophe. This is because by the time the patient presents, the usually the lesions are very large and usually they are not resectable. And most of the time, when you see masses in the tail and body, you already have liver meds. Here, for example, uh, we have liver meds which are seen on contrast in Nance ultrasound. That's another patient with large mass in the tail of the pancreas with already liver meds. And that's a patient with mass in the tail of the pancreas which is infiltrating into the spleen and the stomach. 
So this is very bad for the patient infiltration in the surrounding areas. But this is what happens when you have a tail pancreatic a mass in the tail of the pancreas in the body of the pancreas. That's a mass mass in the body of the pancreas, fairly large at the time of presentation, and these most of them unfortunately have a very bad prognosis. So once you have picked up a mass, the next thing you want to try and give the surgeon some clues about resectability. But honestly, ultrasound fails here or may not do as well as CT scan does. But ultrasound can pick up lymph nodes. Ultrasound can pick up uh, involvement of the vessels like the splenic vein. It can pick up involvement of arteries, etc. So you get some clue about resectability before you subject the patient to CT scan. But the doctor, the, the clinician is definitely going to do a CT scan to differentiate between a resectable tumor and a non-resectable tumor. Then comes a very important uh, subject in pancreas and that is cystic pancreatic masses. Now we see this very often. Sometimes we see them during health checkup. Sometimes the patient comes for something else like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, renal colic and you pick up a cystic mass. Most of them are incidental. Most of them are benign. And at the time of surgery, most of them turn out to be benign. And you feel, why did you dissect? So what is important from ultrasound point of view and from a clinical point of view is one, to pick up a cyst and to know when to worry about a cyst and when not to worry and maybe follow up. So in the, in the uh, uh, following slides, I'll give you some clues about the various lesions. So the most common ones are the pseudocysts, which are associated with pancreatitis. We see serous cystic neoplasms. We see mucinous cystic neoplasms. We can see IPMNs or intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms. And very rarely we see spens and tumors with cystic degeneration. So whenever you see a large cyst, the first thing you find out did they have the patient, the patient have history of pancreatitis. Does the pancreas show some telltale evidence of pancreatitis in which the most in which case the most common diagnosis is going to be a pseudocyst? So serous cyst adenomas, mucinous cyst adenomas, uh, uh, the IPMNs and side branch have variable features in terms of the presentation, in terms of the age, as well as in terms of how they appear on ultrasound. One of the most important things is whether the lesion is communicating with the pancreatic duct or no. If it is not, then we are dealing with these two lesions. So, the, 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 the site of lesion is very important. Typically, uh, the serous cyst neoplasms are seen in the head of the pancreas. The mucinous cystic neoplasms are seen in the body and tail of the pancreas. Pseudocysts can be seen everywhere, but IPMNs are always, if it is a main duct, it is always in the center and there is a communication with the duct. And if it is a side branch IPMN, again, you would be able to demonstrate the duct communication, sometimes if not on transverse abdominal ultrasound, on endoscopic ultrasound. So then when you have a cyst and once you have ruled out the pseudocyst, then we find out whether this lesion is microcystic or macrocystic. If it is macro, most likely it is mucinous. If it is micro and it shows communication with the duct, it's a side branch IPMN, there's no communication with the duct that is likely to be a serous cyst adenoma. Age of the patient, very important. We are familiar with this. Grandmother lesions are serous. Mother lesions are mucinous. Daughter lesions are spen. Spen are very uh, uncommon in, in practice. Calcification, location, which talked about uh, nodularity, etc. can help us in differentiating the type of cystic lesions. Now, that's a classical serous cyst adenoma picked up incidentally. Now, very honestly, though we say it's microcystic, it is very difficult on transabdominal ultrasound to show those microcysts as we see in this case. And there is no doubt that MRI scores over ultrasound in showing the appearance of the uh, of the microcysts as well as the central scar, which is very difficult to see on a conventional ultrasound. So that we have to keep in mind. MR is a very good modality when it comes to cystic. That's a classical mucinous cystic neoplasm. So what we see is typically a lesion in the tail of the pancreas with indefined walls and of course, some septations and small ecogenic areas in the wall. But this is a classical mucinous neoplasm in the tail of the pancreas. That's another one in the tail of the pancreas, septate there, and a small ecogenic focus there. Very often, we see these nodules on the mass uh, in the cystic region, and we'll see the role of contrast when it comes to this uh, particular nodules. Uh, just like ovaries, we can use contrast in the cystic pancreas, and we'll talk about it subsequently. And then this is very interesting. This is a lady who was a doctor's mother. Uh, she came with vague symptoms. We see dilated pancreatic duct. We see dilated CBD. So I thought this is a periamputated lesion. I gave that diagnosis. But on endoscopic ultrasound and on aspiration, this turned out to be an IPMN involving the entire duct. 
So remember that when you have focal dilatation of the duct or we have a mass cystic mass communicating with the duct, think of an IPML as well. Very important in, in practice as well. Then of course we have large solid cystic lesions in, like in this which undoubtedly turn out to be neoplastic in etiology. And this is a very interesting lady uh, who was middle aged 35 years. Actually what happened is that she presented with a renal uh, tumor and they did a, 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 so ultrasound had picked up renal tumor outside and then they did a CT and with the CT they were not happy with the pancreas and we did repeated the ultrasound in our department and we saw this multiple cystic areas in the pancreas, a very rare case of von Dippel lindau syndrome, which we, uh, we all of us know is associated with several things which happen. Okay, so what do we do with pancreas? If they're less than two centimeters, then we can ask for follow-up. If they're more than three centimeters, closing four centimeters, uh, more close four centimeters, we can think of intervention. Anything between two and three, the best thing is to characterize them with MRI, MRCP, or endoscopic ultrasound. And then, depending upon what you see, you might ask for a yearly follow-up or a follow-up after two years. We have been following a good number of patients of uh, uh, cirrhosis adenomas with con who have consequently done very well. So, uh, very often nowadays, uh, we are not very aggressive unless we something see something odd or when the lesion is very large. Then we have unusual pancreatic masses. Uh, we have insulinomas, gastrinomas, VIPomas, etc. Now, for all practical purposes, trans abdominal ultrasound has severe limitations when it comes to this pancreatic endocrine tumors. This is one case of a pancreatic insulinoma, which we saw patient had classical symptoms. So we were looking out for this, and he was my one of my uh, 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 basically friends, a close friend. So in a way, I knew him well, and we picked this up. He was subsequently operated. Unfortunately, somehow or the other, he didn't do well. But this is uh, just a rare case. Most of the time, we can miss them, and therefore, endoscopic ultrasound can be very, very important. This is again a rare case of a pancreatic or blastoma, which can be seen in childhood. This is basically an epithelial exocrine cell tumor. Most of the other things are they arise from the duct, and therefore, they are adenocarcinoma. This is again a one case which we have seen. Lymphomas in the pancreas, not primary, but very often lymph nodes uh, in non Hodgkin's lymphoma can involve pancreas. Metastasis, again, not very common, but we have seen a case from lung. Uh, this was the case which we had from uh, meds from the lung. Uh, then again, uh, when it comes to uh, cox, uh, primary cox of the pancreas may not be seen, but lymph nodes, which are necrotic in the necropedal area, can involve pancreas. And we have seen caseation actually happening within the body of the pancreas because of the lymph nodes. Here, for example, we had a caseated lymph node in the, uh, 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 in the peripancreatic area, uh, which was pushing the pancreas sort of anteriorly in a doctor. So, uh, we have been doing contrast uh, since uh, almost about 13 years or so. And uh, we, that's something, sorry? Yeah. And uh, 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 I'll just show you some examples. Uh, one of the uh, things where we use contrast is in such areas. Here we feel that this is sludge. But when we did contrast, it was enhancing. So that was a periampillary carcinoma, uh, which was uh, subsequently treated accordingly. Uh, uh, now, contrast shows, and Dr. Lee will agree with me, enhancement of septae and enhancement of neural nodules much better than a CT scan. And we have seen this happening in renal cysts also. So typically, when you have a cystic lesion in the pancreas, which shows solid areas, which shows thick areas which are enhancing on contrast, one should think of a neoplastic etiology. So that's a very classical example again of another patient where we have a system with neural nodules which are enhancing on contrast. By the time we saw all this, the patient have definitely had liver meds. So that's a mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. So ability of contrast to pick up enhancement is very, very good in the nodules and septic. Pancreatic in, in mucinous cyst, cyst adenomas. Adenocarcinomas, on the other hand, are hypoenhancing as compared to the rest of the pancreas almost in all phases and typically in the early phase. So in the early phase, the pancreas enhances, the adenocarcinomas show a relatively delayed or very often a hypoenhancement on contrast. Yeah, I'll just finish in two, one minute. Can I finish in one minute or should I stop? No, no. No, yeah. no, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then, of course, here uh, we have another adenocarcinoma, uh, which is again showing hypoenhancement on contrast. So it's a very good tool in day-to-day -day practice if you see a mass just in the contrast. And again, uh, uh, in necrotizing pancreatitis, we can pick up hypoenhancement in necrotizing pancreatitis. And therefore, off late, 
whenever we see pipelines we always do contrast and we are able to fairly well differentiate between interesting and necrotizing pipelines so uh, i would say that especially in country like india bangladesh where we don't want to spend too much every time contrast can play a very important role in this thing. Uh, i was i'm very lucky to work in jaslok where we have interoperative probes for many years and uh, we have done a lot of interoperative work as far as pancreas are concerned typically in endocrine tumors here again vascular anatomy is very important because once you go into ot and put the probe you get lost because we are not used to all this so here for example was an insulinoma which was extremely vascular uh, here we have we had another, another focal lesion so what you have to do is uh, show the lesion to the surgeon uh, show the relationship of the lesion to the duct and to the surrounding vessels very often we might do an biopsy or an fnac of that lesion in that on the table as well endoscopic ultrasound i am associated with pankaj who does all of endoscopic ultrasound there are a lot of patients and he gives us feedbacks uh, he has been doing it for many years uh, it is helpful in staging of tumors uh, it is helpful of course in uh, 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 in fnacs in fact if you want to do fnac of a pancreatic mass or of a cyst it is best done under endoscopic ultrasound this is one of the best technique to do uh, uh fnacs uh, 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 for cytological diagnosis then of course neuroendocrine tumors are picked up better on endoscopic ultrasound uh, pseudocysts we can put a stent with the help of endoscopic ultrasound uh, from the stomach into the cyst and of course uh, lastly uh, if, if, if we now have endoscopic ultrasound probes which have elastography and which have contrast and we have started using that as as well so overall pancreatic ultrasound is very challenging but very fruitful Uh, uh it is uh, the role is underestimated in clinical practice uh, people prefer ct but ultrasound can do a lot very often the pathologies are first picked up on on ultrasound and then followed up uh, uh, subsequently it's a very good tool to follow up because it's cheaper uh, we have to understand limitations we don't have to be over confident and then newer techniques like uh, for elastography endoscopic ultrasound intraoperative play a very important role in this This is a very nice reference book uh, which was published in July this year uh, by the Ipsum, and I would uh, urge uh, people to go through it. It's a very very nice book uh, edited by one of my close friend, Adetrish. So thank you so much, all of you. And if we can go to the questions. So Sudhir, should I? Uh, thank you, Nitin, for that excellent uh, talk on pancreas. As usual, uh, we expect the best from you. Uh, uh, I think uh, the back office will run the the poll. Until then, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, yeah. One question is: uh, If you see a bulky pancreas, is it always abnormal? No. Uh, we can have uh, variability in terms of size in pancreas as well as appearance. So it all depends on the clinical situation. So if the clinical situation is uh, that of an acute pancreatitis. Your serum amyloid is lipase elevated. There are criteria now for acute pancreatitis. We have scoring systems. So if if it is fitting into that, then definitely. But there can be variability in terms of size of the pancreas as well as uh, appearance. So we don't go by that. So uh, good. So yeah, fantastic. So all is true of serous cystic neoplasms, except they do not. Uh, except that they. Uh, they do not show communication to pancreatic duct. So uh, more than sixty, per, almost sixty percent have given a correct answer. That's a very good thing to happen. So they will project the next question. They will yeah, project the next question. Yeah. The next poll. I have one more question. Yeah. Is if you have an isoechoic oval lesion sitting near the head of the pancreas, isoechoic, how do you differentiate between normal pancreatic tissue? abnormal lesion or a lymph node so first of all how do you pick up an isoechoic lesion i mean it's difficult and once you say isoechoic I, i would i would not be able to pick it up but in any way sitting beside but, the okay, okay so so, uh, so so we if if at all there is any suspicion uh, and uh, then uh, on ultrasound then we need to do a, do a something else like an mr for example the focal pancreatic uh, focal fatty change in the pancreas i said it's a mass and only mr said that it is there so if there is a doubt then definitely we uh, if you have an access to contrast uh, well you can inject contrast there on the table if it is a lesion it will show a different pattern if it is isoenhancing then it is most likely like to be a part of the normal pancreas 
But if you don't have an access, if you have a doubt, then I think MR on endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound is wonderful. Now, um, are there any set protocols when you will uh, shift from ultrasound to MR? Very nice question. So, uh, yeah, since I work in a private uh, diagnostic center as well as in an institute, uh, uh, this is a good question for me. In the sense that in our institute, when the patients come to us, either they have already been walked up or they would go definitely for a CT scan. If it is a tumor, they would go for the, like adenocarcinoma is suspected, they would go for a CT first. Uh, suppose it's a cystic lesion and you want to characterize the cystic lesion, you want to show if it's communicating with the duct, then MRI and MRCP are better modalities. If you are dealing with something like acute pancreatitis and you want to show sure whether it's necrotizing, you want to see the spread of disease, you would definitely do a CT scan. So it all depends upon uh, what the clinical suspicion is. If, if, if something like an endocrine tumor is there, we will do a CT but we will add it up with an endoscopic ultrasound. Depends on the clinical situation, there is no hard and fast uh, rule about what we do. Uh, in, but follow-ups is uh, the, where ultrasound I think plays a very important role, especially okay. in perial context. Here we have the poll for the next yeah. question. So I think the audience is brilliant. Here again we asked whether how is the pattern on uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. I was expecting people to say rapid enhancement and washout, as Dr. Lee said uh, uh, in most of the uh, uh, malignancies of the liver. Definitely, it is hypo, hypo enhancing in, as related to the rest. Of Thank, Thank you, so you Nitin. Thank you for that Thanks a lot. Thanks. discussion. Now we move on to our next um, topic and that is uh, pitfalls and pseudo lesions of kidney. And the speaker is Dr. John Yon Cho from uh, Seoul. And uh, I'll uh, like to introduce him now. He is a professor uh, at the Department of Radiology, Seoul National University Hospital and Seoul uh, National University College of Medicine, Korea. He has done his MD from Seoul National University, then he has done his Master of Science and PhD from Seoul National University in 2000. He is uh, President of Korean Society of Urogenital Radiology from 2014 to 2016. He is uh, Secretary General of KSUM from 2016 to 18. Chairman Board of Directors of Korean Society of Ultrasound in Medicine 2016 to 19, and currently he is the Secretary of AFSM from 2020 to 2022. He has published more than 150 articles and received several Korean and international awards. Over to you, Dr. Cho. Thank you, Dr. Gokale. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be a speaker of GE Absom webinar today. I'd like to thank Dr. Gokale and local organizing committee and GE for all the effort organizing this. On daily killing ultrasound, we may meet many kinds of pseudo regions and the peoples those may cause misdiagnosis and unnecessary further evaluations and procedures. In this short lecture, I'd like to review common pseudo regions and the peoples of kidney ultrasound and summarize the differential points from the true uh, regions. Let's start with the invisible kidney and pseudo kidney. Uncommon, not uncommonly, uh, we cannot see the kidney on the daily uh, practice. That is due to the nephrectomy or the renal agenesis, and the severe atrophy or atopic in kidney can also make the invisible kidney in the daily practice. Uh, but the more common cause is the poor sounding window due to the bowel gas or abdominal fat. On the contrary, the adjacent organs such as bowel loops or uneven pro uh, prominent fat tissue 
and while tumors can mimic the uh, kidney. Let's take a look at this case. There is a round mesolite region in the left lunar fossa. Uh, this is not the true uh, uh, left kidney, but looks like a similar uh, configuration of the left lunar kidney, uh, left kidney. But this is not the kidney, that is the uh, dilatated bowel loop. You can see here. And this patient actually has very small atrophic kidney in the pelvic uh, uh, cavity. This is the case of the pseudo kidney due to the uh, bowel loop. Uh, this is a case of a 30 week fetus. Uh, you can see the right kidney here. Do you think this is a left kidney? But this is not the true kidney, that is the, also the uh, bowel loop. Actually, this, uh, the left kidney of the, this fetus is located in the just upper portion of the urinary bladder, as you can see here. And you can see also the left renal vein drained into the left common iliac vein. This is the case of the fetal ectopic kidney. How about this case? This is a light renal fossa. Only you can see the several conglomerated cysts you can see here, but there is no definite uh, lenar parenchyma. And you can see there also only the several conglomerated cysts, only very small pot, part of the uh, kidney parenchyma. This is a multicyst dispersed kidney in the other case. Let's move on to the pseudohydronephrosis. Uh, there are many causes of the uh, pseudohydronephrosis, including extra-renal pelvis, parapelvic cyst, dialect renal vessels, and transient hydronephrosis due to the uh, bladder distension. How about this case? Uh, we can see the mildly dilated renal pelvis and the calyxis, but the CT levels only mildly prominent renal pelvis and calyxis but there is no definite uh, excretion delay compared with the right side. This is the typical example of the external pelvis with very mild uh, UPJ stenosis. Let's move on to the other case. How about this case? There looks like a mildly prominent renal pelvis and calyxis. Do you think it's uh, hydronephrosis or pseudohydronephrosis such as the extra nephrosis just like the just before case? But IBU libid, there's no dilatation of the renal calyxis or pelvis. Only we can see the just mild compression of this uh, left side renal pelvis by something. The CT levels, multiple cyst lesions compressing the lenar pelvis in both kidneys. This is the parapelvic cyst. The parapelvic cyst is also the very common cause of the pseudohydronephrosis, cyst, make the uh, further evaluation of the CT exam. Actually, the differential diagnosis of the parapelvic cyst on the ultrasound is not easy. Compared with the true hydronephrosis, the cyst region looks like a pelvis or calyx is not definitely communicated compared with the true hydronephrosis. And the dilatation of the calyx like lesions not approximate to the renal parenchyma, and there are also skipped region in this portion, unlike this true hydronephrosis. These are, uh, these are the uh, differential points of the parapelvic to compared with the, uh, from the uh, true hydronephrosis, but sometimes it's not easy uh, in daily ultrasound. How about these two cases? 
looks like a mildly dilated renal pelvis or calyx and small calyxial dilatation or small cyst lesion in this case. But the DDS levels, those are the dilated renal vein and also aneurysmal small dilatation of the renal artery. This is a pseudohydronephrosis or pseudohydrocalicosis due to the dilatated renal vessels. How about this case? Looks like a mild dilatation of the renal pelvis and calyx in both kidneys. But this is the same patient on the other day. There is no partial dilatation at all in both kidneys. The difference is only the dilatation of the bladder compared with this day. Then we can say this is a transient process or transient product, renal pelvis or calyx due to bladder distension. Then this case uh, tells us we need to evaluation of the bladder distension uh, during the uh, kidney ultrasound. Let's uh, move on to the cyst. The cyst is the most common uh, lesion uh, on the ultrasound, but the small, cyst, the simple cyst usually did not uh, further evaluation or uh, routine evaluation. But pseudo regions can mimic renal cyst, including renal pelvis, calyxis, uh, calyctasia, and calyxial diverticulum, and renal artery, renal artery anurage. Let's take a look at these two cases. You can see the very small, low echogenic lesion here. Do you think this is a small cyst or not? Yes, this is not the cyst, but the normal medulla. And how about this one? Is there a multi conglomerate cyst lesion in the lower of the right kidney in this patient? But this is not the cyst, but the focal calyctasia. How about this case? There is a small round cyst lesion in the lower of the right kidney of the, this patient. This is the actual image. And you can see on the IVP, there is a small round lesion filled with the contrast media. This is the finding of calyxial diverticulum mimicking the small cyst on the ultrasound. How about this case? Round cyst lesion located in the renal sinus portion, but this is the renal artery and region, and there is also a thrombus portion in the peripheral portion of the region. Let's move on to the shooter tumor. There are many regions mimicking the solid renal tumor, including clomobotin, dromedary hump, and localized compensate hypertrophy, and the fetal lobulation. Uh, this patient visited our hospital due to the incidentally detected right renal mass on the ultrasound from the local clinic. You can see the slightly hyperechal region in the mid portion of the right kidney, and you can see the round region here on the actual image. But the color of the ultrasound labels no mass effect, and there is a passing through the renal arteries, you can see here and also here. And the uh, CDUS labels, no difference of the enhancement of the region compared with the other part of the renal cortex that suggests the prominent column of Bertin. And uh, also the CT labels, no different portion of the cortical enhancement, and this is the column of Bertin. You can see also here. The prominent columbo button is the most common renal shooter tumor. It is a thick aggregated of the cortical tissue. It is usually uh, occurs developed in the 
junction of the upper and middle third of the kidney. The differential point, ultrasound differential point of the chromatin from the true tumor is the pass-through sign of the renal vessel, as you can see in this case. Here are large vessel-like region, but the vessels are pass-through like the other part of the uh, renal parenchyma. There is no mass effect. Let's compare with these two cases. There is a mildly echogenic region in the mid portion of the right kidney. And also in this case, there is a round mass region looks similar with upper one. But the upper, in the upper one, the renal artery is pass, passing through the region. But in this case, there is a mass effect like this. The vessels are sweeping by the mass, and there is a peripheral vascularity in the mass region. The CT levels no mass, but in the case, there is a definite mass region. The upper one is the prominent clomobrotin, and lower one is renal cell carcinoma. about this case? There is also a round mass-like region on the left kidney. But the CDUS level is also the passing through of the uh, vessel. You can say that is the plumbotin also. The CT level is no mass region, just contour bulging of the lateral border of the left kidney. This is not the clomobotin, but the dro renal dromedary hump. Actually, the dromedary is the one hump hammer, and the dromedary hump is a prominent bulging on the lateral border of the kidney due to the molding by the spleen or liver during the fetal life. It is more common on the left side compared with the right side. Also, the differential point on the ultrasound is passing through sign of the renal vessels, as you can see in this case. How about this case? There is also a control bulging mass region, you can see here, but there are also several cortical defects, you can see here and here also. And the CT reveals also the multiple cortical defects and my dilatation of the renal calyx. Uh, but there is no uh, definite mass lesion, unlike the uh, uh, differentiate from the other uh, renal parenchyma. That is the focal compensate hypertrophy in patients with bony pyelonephritis. How about this case? There is also a round mass-like region here in the upper portion of the right kidney. And the underlying renal parenchyma is shows hyperechogenic and the size is decreased and the renal parenchyma is also thinning, means end-stage renal disease. And the MR levels, no mass region unlike with other part of the renal parenchyma. That is due to the localized compensate hypertrophy in the patient with end-stage renal disease. Let's look at this woman. There is a contraverging mass-like region here, and also the older renal parenchyma uh, has some lobulating outer uh, margin. But the CT levels, no mass region, just have a multiple lobulating contour in both sides of the kidneys. And this point is the, that point, looks like a mass region on the ultrasound, but this is not the true mass region, but the just the contour bulging of the left kidney. That is the pseudo kidney, due to, uh, pseudo mass due to the fetal lobulation.
The fetal ovulation is due to the incomplete assimilation of the boundary of the each lobes of the kidney during the fetal life. It may mimic the CPN scars and the lena tumor. As you can see in the previous case, the depression point on the ultrasound from the CPN scar are smooth even bruising with regular spacing, as you can see here, regular spacing, and absence of the calyxial deformity. How about this case? There is a round mass lesion at the upper pole of the left kidney, and the color of profound libus less like lesion. But the CT and the MR libus no mass lesion from the kidney, but there is this point is the tail of the pancreas. This is the pseudo tumor due to the prominent pancreas tail. How about this case? There is a wedge-shaped right echogenic lesion on the right kidney. As you can see on the actual image also the wedge shape of the, this region. And also you can see the continuation of the this right echogenic of the lesion to the renal sinus fat tissue. This is the junctional parenchymal defect. The junctional parenchymal defect is triangular echogenic area continuation with the renal sinus and this region is due to the incomplete fusion of the two embryogenic parenchyma of the kidney. It usually appears at the upper pole in the right kidney and lobe of the left kidney. The junctional parenchyma defect needs to be differentiated from the parenchyma scar or angiomyelipoma. Let's take a look at these three cases. Looks like very similar with each other. Do you think is there any case of junctional parenchymal defect? But this one is postoperative defect after the partial lepectomy. And this is the previous case of the CPN scar. You can see here. And how about this one? Looks like very similar, but there is a true mass region with fat that is a small angiomyelipoma. Then uh, it is not easy to differentiate this kind of wedge shaped right echogenic region on the uh, kidney ultrasound. Let's move on to the pseudo tumor of the renal pelvis. Let's compare with these two cases. The sinus fat echogenicity is not normal, very decreased, looks like a mass region in the renal pelvis. Let's compare these two cases, also looks like a low soft, echogenic soft tissue region in the renal pelvis. But the CT levels, no mass region in this case, only the prominent renal sinus fat, but this case is true mass region in the upper pole of the left kidney and also the left pelvis. This is the renal sinus lipomatosis and this case is a urocellular carcinoma of the renal pelvis. Looks like very similar on the ultrasound. This is due to the decreased echogenicity of the renal sinus fat and this finding is usually detected on the old fatty patient. Uh, this low equivalence of the fat tissue looks like the soft tissue mass region. And also you can see the perianal fat equivalency that is very decreased compared with the uh, normal younger generation. This is the pseudo, this is the case, this is the case of the pseudo tumor of the renal pelvis due to the renal sinus lipomatosis. This is the last part of my talk. 
there are several right foci of the right kidney, as you can see here and also here. Is this the character stone or papillary classification? But the CT level is only tiny cysts you can see here and also in the left kidney. Many regions may be making the small renal stones. That is, uh, those are also called as unidentified bright objects on the ultrasound. That appears as a small echogenic foci without clear posterior shadowing. These regions are included uh, the renal uh, stone beam, uh, unidentified bright object uh, included the papillary calcification tiny calcial stone, tiny cyst, calcial diverticulum, vascular calcification, and also tiny angiomyelipoma. The differential dynamics on the ultrasound of these regions are not easy in most of the cases, and we need the CT exam for the differentiation. But the for the evaluation or routine follow-up is usually not necessary without symptom. I'd like to summarize my talk today like uh, this. The variety of peoples and pseudo regions may mimic true regions on the kidney ultrasound, including invisible and pseudo kidneys, pseudo hydronephrosis, pseudo cysts, and pseudo tumors, and stone mimickers. Then we need a careful ultrasound exam with understand of possible peoples and pseudo region on the kidney ultrasound. Please use the pro ultrasound during the kidney ultrasound and don't hesitate to recommend the CT if we cannot get the differential dynamics of this region on the ultrasound. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Thank you for that nice uh, talk with so many examples of lesions that, that uh, really fox us uh, during the examination of kidney. So let us have the, um, the poll, uh, the question and the poll for the audience. And till then, uh, till the, the back office runs the poll, I have a uh, some questions from the audience uh, I'll pose to Dr. Cho. One is, um, how do you, uh, is there any clue to differentiate a parapelvic cyst from a prominent renal pelvis? Yes, I already mentioned about that. Uh, it's not easy in many cases, but the somewhat different differential point is the glottated structure looks like uh, renal pelvis and calyx is not well communicated in case of parapelvic cystis and also looks like a calyxial dilatation portion is not approximate to the renal parenchyma or renal medulla unlike the uh, true hydronephrosis that is the differential point but sometimes it's not so easy in many cases. All right. Um, uh, then uh, several questions about uh, the small renal stones. You already mentioned a list of differentials for small renal stones, uh, which can confuse us. And here we uh, have the, the poll for your question. Yes. Would you comment on that? Uh, yes, I mentioned already in my uh, lecture, these are very uh, simple questions. What is the most common cause of renal pseudo tumor on the ultrasound exam is plumobotin. It is most common compared with the other dromedary hump or fetal lobulation or junctional parenchymal defect is um, not so common case compared with the Clomobrotin. So most of the audience have the answer yes. correct? Yeah. Yes, um, correct. Till the uh, back office runs the poll on the second question, I just want to ask you, 
about these small uh, renal calculi, uh, uh, to, what is your experience of using color Doppler and uh, looking for that twinkling artifact? Yes, it's helpful, I think so. But if the size very, very small, very, very tiny, also the twinkling artifact is not, of course. We cannot see the twinkling artifact. See the twinkling. Also, it will depend on the angle of insulation. The twinkling, yeah. it will depending on angle of insulation. Yeah. yeah, but it's a price thing, so yeah. Okay. Um, do we have the result of the second poll? The most common cause of pseudo hydronephrosis on ultrasound examination. And there you have uh, the result. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yeah, I already mentioned in, during the, my lecture, and the uh, extra prep is more common. Also, the paraprepex is, is also common, but the instance, I think, is much higher of the extra prep is compared to the paraprepex cyst. Right. Thank you, Professor Cho. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent talk. Let us move on to the okay, next thank you very topic. Much. And uh, the next speaker uh, for today is uh, 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 Dr. Kanu Bala. He is from uh, Bangladesh and uh, he is Professor of Ultrasound and Imaging of the University of Science and Technology. He is Director of Bangladesh Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine and Research. He is a graduate of Dhaka University. He received his doctorate from Dhaka University and also from University of Science and Technology. He was awarded FRCP twice from the Royal College of Physicians in Dublin and also from in Glasgow. He is a pioneer in introducing and developing biological research. In 2004, uh, Rufum established the first center of excellence in Dhaka under his leadership. He is a recipient of several awards and is a well-known speaker at several UFM and AFSM congresses. He has authored three books and uh, an author of more than 150 articles. Dr. Kanubala is going to talk about uh, urinary bladder, the forgotten organ. Over to you, Dr. Bala. Thank you, Professor Gokhle, for your nice introduction. And I would like to thank the APSUM for organizing this wonderful workshop. I think the most of the participants, they are from this subcontinent. So I think uh, many participants, they are mainly from India and also a good number from Bangladesh and the surrounding country. So I would like to thank the APSUM once again. My topic is urinary bladder, ultrasound, the neglected organ. Yeah. Urinary bladder is one of the earliest uh, organs which is examined and follow up by the ultrasound. But subsequently, the area of examination that is expanded, more complex and difficult organs, difficult situations, they come up and ultimately the urinary bladder just going back. Many times we just at the end of our examination, we just hurriedly go through urinary bladder. So that is the history of urinary bladder ultrasound, a bit neglected. It is a hollow muscular organ. We know this is reservoir of urine, capacity 400 to 500 milliliter. Uh, posteriorly, there are uh, some sex organs, both male and female, and anteriorly related to sympathesis pubis and lower abdominal 
well, this is very in short uh, anatomy of the urinary bladder. And one thing which I usually astonished by seeing that urinary bladder is just like heart. In case of a heart, heart is receiving blood and pumping blood throughout the whole body. And here also the same, same mechanism, same function. It is receiving the urine from both kidneys through urethra and again it is pumping this urine through urethra. So this is very much similar to heart. And patient preversion, we all of us know that when the patient come to examine the urinary bladder, we used to tell them to drink four and five glasses of water before examination and then the patient come with full bladder. There is one fallacy in the most of the very busy uh, center for a lot of patients and as soon as the patient come they used to take water and when this patient come to the patient bed there, there is a full of uh, urine full of blood patient is in discomfort and it creates two problems on uh, patient really feeling discomfort and if we press transducer hard, there may be some accident. You can see the bed is wet. That is one problem. Another problem that is more vital, that is a psychological problem. When the patient is feeling discomfort, then the examiner, they has a tendency to hurry the examination, missing so many useful findings. So we should not examine a patient with poor distended bladder. So what, what we can do? Sometimes I ask the patient to partial emptying your bladder. But you know that is an absurd thing. Partial emptying of bladder, especially poor distended bladder, that is, that is not possible. So it is very easy to, again, to ask the patient, just why? Again, uh, take two or uh, three or four glasses of water. And there are uh, techniques and instruments, the most common. And in fact, that is the only uh, system of examining urinary bladder that is supra-pubic per abdomen with 3.5 to 5 megahertz transducer, mostly carbilinear. That is the picture you can see. And perineal approach. This approach is not well practiced. We know the perineum is the area between the scrotum and the anus or vagina and the anus. This is the perineum. To just placing the transducer here, we can see the uh, urinary bladder. But that is not practiced. But in my experience, I have found that, especially the elderly man and woman, Many times they fail to retain urine in their urinary bladder. So in those cases, probably we can at least see the urinary bladder through this approach. Here you can see this is the urinary bladder, this is the prostate, so this is the perineal approach. But one very major problem for perineal approach, that the perineal tissue, there are a lot of muscular muscle and, and the fascia and everything. So vivid type of tissue and it just prevents the proper penetration of ultrasound. So, so ultimately the image is not very good quality. So that is, that is only the last resort in some patients. And also during transrectal or transvaginal examination we used to see some part of urinary blood. And why we use the ultrasound in case of bladder examination? We usually see bladder wall anatomy, the thickness, focal abnormalities, trapeculation or diverticulum, bladder capacity, post voidal residual irritable, anatomy of bladder base, distal ureteric anatomy, and intravesical structure. All these are items which we usually see. And what is the normal urinary bladder? wall, a full bladder wall is 2 to 3 millimeter thick. 
and if it is smooth, but in empty, in case of empty bladder, the wall is 5 millimeter thick. Tape. Tape is also very important. A moderately distended urinary bladder in transverse section that is rectangular in shape, in the long section it is triangular in shape. But in one study, the, the researcher found that when the bladder is only moderately filled, only then they found the rectangular shape. Otherwise, when it is overfilled, then the all, all the urinary bladder are not rectangular, rather it is become a bit circular. So, uh, to find out these findings, we must uh, keep attention on this pattern also. Here you can see this is urinary bladder in CT, urinary bladder in MRI, and this is ultrasound, and this is another ultrasound picture. And what is it? What is it? This is not rectangular shape. So, immediately we, we must have some suspicion whether this is urinary bladder or not. Here is uterus. So, of course, this is female fashion. Then what is it? You see, this is a cyst, Korean cyst. And this cyst that pushed urinary bladder to the side. This is a small part of urinary bladder. Fortunately, there is a very small amount of uh, urine in this urinary bladder. For that reason, I can find out that this is urinary bladder. Otherwise, it was very difficult to say that this, this one is not urinary bladder, except its shape. Everything is just like urinary bladder. So, shape is very important. How, how we can differentiate whether it is urinary bladder or not? We can do, either we can ask the patient to go to the uh, bathroom and void your urine and then returning back. If, if this one is urinary bladder, definitely the next time this size will be smaller. Or if the size is the same, then we can ask the patient to drink more water, then this urinary bladder, this part, will be uh, larger. So, in that way, we can differentiate whether this one is cyst or urinary bladder. And urinary bladder, of course, the shape is uh, distorted or shape is influenced by surrounding normal structure or surrounding pathology. This one is just a urine, uterine fibroid and we can see uh, this is a bit distorted. And also the enlarged prostate, that also there usually that indented inside the urinary bladder, dist uh, distorting the step of urinary bladder. And urinary jet, uh, we know all of us, the urinary jet, that can be seen jetting uh, in, into the bladder. This presence can exclude most of the time whether there is any obstruction, either unilateral or bilateral. And sometimes we, we can also use the Doppler, power Doppler especially, then we can see this dead very nicely. And if there is, uh, just like this one, there are two Z, so double ureter. So this is helpful. And debris in urine. Uh, sometimes fine or coarse suspended equals, we usually find in urinary bladder. And most of the time we mention it and we ask the patient or the uh, consultant to go for urine analysis. That is our routine practice. But what is the real condition? The real condition, here you can see the correlating the sonographic findings of ecogenic debris in bladder lumen with urine analysis. This study was done in 2016 and this researcher found that there is no relation, no relation between suspended echo inside urinary bladder and the findings of urine analysis. No relation, either positive way or negative way. So there is no reason to suggest urine analysis if we find there are sus suspended particles inside urinary bladder. And there are, of course, there are two artifacts which we should very much cautious. One is enhancement. Uh, any any cystic structure 
or any structure with low attenuation distal to that structure the, the area is just bloom that it becomes more ecogenic and that usually causes uh, difficult to examine the distal structure at the same time the urinary bladder wall so we have to each and every time we have to just uh, reduce the gain otherwise we shall miss some important findings and another one is artifact reverberation artifact when we examine the urinary bladder we see that there are some echoes just like soft tissue echoes at the proximal area of urinary bladder this is reverberation artifact this part is just seen here. There are some definite explanation, but this, this is present uh, every urinary bladder. What is the problem? The problem is if there is any lesion in this area that may be missed very easily. Here you can see inside this reverberation artifact there is a small, not so much small, there is a mass, this mass, quite big. But very difficult to examine. If this mass was very small, just like 10 millimeter or 5 millimeter size, it is almost missed. So we, we should we should care about this reverberation. And what is the urine volume measurement? That is a very uh, difficult, not difficult, but a, a bit tricky and confused area. In different books, they have told this differently and different lecturer. They also be that with different, but this is the correct procedure. In the transverse scanning, we only can take the transverse measurement, not superior inferior measurement, not this measurement. This measurement only can be taken in long section. In long section, we can take those, these two measurements, superior inferior and interior posterior. Never, we, sh we shall not take a superior inferior measurement in transverse scanning, which we usually do. That is a routine practice. That is a great mistake. So what is what is the uh, urine volume measurement? There are different uh, type of calculation uh, prescribed by, by different authors, but I think this calculation is quite good enough. This is D1, this is D2, and this is D3 in centimeter. And all this, we just multiply all this along with 0.7. This is the uh, milliliter uh, of this, um, just capacity of this unit. Another very important germination that is post vital residual urine, that most of the time that gives some idea about the function of the urine bladder. And many times we fail to do that. We just ask the patient after the examination is completed, we just ask the patient to go to the bathroom and come, come back and we shall see whether there is any residual urine. And there are two things, very important. Number one, in a very busy uh, center, if you start examining at 8 a.m., at 10 a.m., you just go to your bathroom the examine it. Most of the bathroom that is not usable. And the patient, many times the patient hesitate to void the urine. So there are lot of residual urine. Number one. Number two, most of the time the urine, urinary bladder is over distended. And the urine, over distended urinary bladder, most of the time they fail, fail to void completely. That is number one. And another message, when the PBR is more than 100 milliliter, we shall uh, ask the patient to go for another voiding. So another voiding is necessary. Here you can see on the study, effect of pre-micturational bladder volume on accuracy of post-void residual urine volume measurement by trans-abdominal ultrasound. You see, when, when it is mild, very mild, then voiding post-residual urine volume is very negligible on plasma lesion. When it is moderate, then it is 11 or 12 <coughs> milliliter. But when uh, the urinary bladder is over distended, very large, large amount of residual volume, 58, 
So every time when the bladder is just mild or moderately distended, we should go, should go for residual growth. And bladder tumors, this is the second most common cancer of the genitourinary tract. It accounts for 7% in men and 2% for in women. And bladder cancer is primarily a disease of men older than 65 years. There is a close relation between cigarette smoking. So smokers have a two to four fold higher risk of bladder cancer. And of course we know there are um, staging, TNM staging, T4 tumor, N4, F node, M4 metastasis. This is very useful person to take decision that is very important. And here you can see T2A and just uh, below this T2A, all these uh, tumors, they just superficial tumors. And they uh, do not invade the muscular layer. So their management is different. Just by cystoscope, the urologist, they just take this uh, tumor out. Very easy management. And hospital stay one or two days medicine. But when the stage is beyond 2A, just like this, that is very, very, very difficult. And also prognosis is very bad. Excision of the urinary bladder and again reconstruction of the urinary bladder. That is, that is a really, really a major operation. So the diagnosis is very important. As early as we can diagnose a tumor that is helpful for the patient, that is helpful for the surgeon. But here, here you can see very small size, a small size tumor. This, is, this size is 12 into 10 millimeters. This is 27 into 8. This is a small, but not so small. And here you can see another study, correlation of transeptuminal sonography and cystoscopic findings in the diagnosis of total abnormality of urinary blood abnormal. When it is less than 5, cent, five millimeter size, here you can see sonographic detection is 3, whereas cystoscopic de detection is 9. So in, in those cases, ultrasonography is not a modality of choice. Cystoscopy is the modality of but other than less than 5 millimeter size, every year, there you can see that the figure is quite high. Then. So, more than, when the size is more than 5 centimeter, ultrasound is the modality of size, not the cystoscope. Of course, there are different type of tumors. This is the broad-based, broad-based tumor. This is villous type tumor, just finger-like finger projection. And the whole thickness of tumor, this is very difficult for diagnosis and most of, most of the symptom and the findings they just limit with, with the acute inflammation and of course there are uh, hematuria, there are pain and also all those findings that, that quite fit well with cystitis. So this is, this is very difficult and here you can see a very rare case of urinary blood abnormal. And recurrence. What is the recurrence? Natural history of bladder tumor is recurrence. So every time after operation, we can expect that there must be heavy recurrence. So follow up, follow up very uh, important part for this session. That this recurrence can be happened at any time, at same or different site, at the same stage or more advanced stage. Of course, uh, there are possibilities of secondaries in the urinary bladder and most of the time they come from the surrounding structure and commonly from the CSR mix, prostate cancer. And of course, we can use the volume rendering image because this is the two-dimensional structure where we cannot get the correct exact picture tumor when it is number is four. The same patient thus is examined with CT, not, not so very well picture, only, only one of two, very small size. And here is the volume rendering image. And we can see the real picture of the so many tumors, different place, different. 
step. So this, these are sometimes very helpful. Endometriosis, another condition. Endometriosis. What is endometriosis? This is the only benign condition which has the characteristics of malignancy. Just like uh, malignancy, it can, this can metastasis from one place to another place. So endometriosis, has, it, though it is benign condition, it has many characteristics of malignancy. Endometriosis, our urinary bladder is a common location and mostly this is symptomatic. Urination frequency, urgency, dysuria, and most importantly, hemorrhage. But the diagnosis is not so easy. If the uh, endometriosis is confined only in the urinary bladder, it is very difficult to diagnose. But if this endometriosis is located in a normal position or other positions, then it is uh, easy to diagnose endometriosis. Otherwise, until the surgeon open the urinary bladder, diagnosis is not complete. Urinary bladder infection, that is very common infection. In acute cystitis, most of the time we get no fissure, no fissure of the urinary bladder wall. But when it is severe infection or inflammation, then we can get the three layer sign. Just like chronic polycystitis, here also in chronic uh, acute, poly, uh, acute cystitis, you can get three layer sign. And also some there are some debris and other findings. Recurrent cystitis that is caused by bacterial persistence and uh, repeatedly there are infections. In those cases we usually find the thickened urinary bladder wall and also trabeculation and of course there are residual urine and many times there are some debris. All these are ultrasonable fissures, recurrent cystitis. Hemorrhagic cystitis, that is rare, but very dangerous situation. Now, usually that is due to E. coli, some special type of E. coli, and sometimes there are due to drugs or toxins, or post-radiation therapy, the mucous membrane of the urinary blood that is slapped up. Also inside there is some clot or debris, so sometimes these are very serious conditions and ultrasound is a very useful modality for diagnosis. Urinary bladder diverticulum that is outward, the congenital, outward mostly bladder outlet obstruction. Hyper, that is mainly hypertrophic muscle bundle cause trabeculation and there are a small pocket like this. This is diverticulum, there is one very special condition which is called cameloid bladder that, that occurred in working women. The working, working women in their office, they used to feel shy to go to bathroom for providing urine. So they retain urine in their bladder for long time. The urinary bladder is over distended and there are some residual even at the same time there are possibilities of bladder diverticulum. Uh, there are two problems for bladder, bladder diverticulum as because there are stasis, there is the possibility of a stone formation and there are 5% possibilities of transitional cell casting. Then urinary bladder is stone. That is, once upon a time, during our student life, we frequently come through urinary bladder stone. But nowadays, the student, they get urinary bladder stone very rarely because the hygiene and other conditions that we improve. And in developing countries, there is one quality that is found in pre-pubertian boys, that is uh, urinary bladder. The incidence is really, it is decreasing. And the diagnosis, you can see the diagnosis is just like gallstone, the three criteria. That's something more ecogenic inside the urinary bladder, on a structure more ecogenic, it is cast in distal acoustic shadow and it is mobile. With change of body posture, 
this structure that moves from one side to another side. If we find all these findings in uh, any structure, then the diagnosis is almost 100% correct. And what are the causes of urinary bladder stone? That is voiding dysfunction, or in body, or a, uh, uh, infections at kidney or urinary stones. you have a couple of minutes. Time, time. A couple of minutes more. Okay. Uh, urinary bladder, uh, that is a very interesting organ. I will tell what is it? It is looking like urinary bladder, which is a mass. But here you can see, this is actually, this is ascites. This is mass. And, and here you can see the urinary bladder. In conclusion, urinary bladder is one of the earliest organs scanned and evaluated by ultrasound. But nowadays, the organ we just sweep the organ and examination at the last of the session. We should give proper attention to the ultrasound evaluation. This is the picture here, here you can see all this. 2018 in Dhaka, the workshop. Thank you very much. Now I have two questions. Uh, can I say they will yeah. Um, by the time the back office runs the poll for questions from Dr. Bala, I have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Dr. Bala, uh, what is the bladder wall thickness in children? Uh, very interestingly, there is not so much difference between bladder wall of children and bladder wall of adults. Almost same. Almost not so very much difference. Okay. Another question is about the uh, you talked about the uh, urine in bladder when it appears slightly echogenic, and there are studies which showed that uh, uh, it's not uh, necessarily abnormal. So, do we ignore that finding or do we report on that finding? Uh, we, we definitely we have to uh, give the finding because that is our duty. What we are saying, we must say that. But the interpretation or asking for urine analysis, we should not do that. That is my suggestion. But definitely okay, here we shall. We have the, the poll for the first question. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, actually, I was expecting that uh, this is a very, very easy question. So that must be uh, okay, 100% correct. But unfortunately, it is only 60%. Three millimeters. All right. It is, it is so till they, they run the poll on the, the second question from Dr. Bala, here is one more uh, question. Uh, is about uh, can we comment on the uh, bladder wall invasion by the bladder tumor. How reliable is ultrasound to uh, tell that ultra the tumor? Ultrasound is not at all reliable. We can say, see the bladder wall invasion very precisely because this is very important. When the invasion, when there is invasion, the uh, operation is very elaborate. The prognosis is very ultrasound is not at all a reliable model for this so, especially to uh, see the invasion. If, if uh, one is suspecting invasion, uh, would you think that a transvaginal ultrasound might show the bladder wall uh, better? Uh, we, we can try, but uh, that is not a routine procedure because transvaginal ultrasound sometimes they fail to see the whole bladder, only a small area, either by transrectal or transvaginal, a small area we can see. And when it is contacted, then it is very difficult to see all the layers very distinctly. So we must ask for help from other, other modalities. 
Okay, you have the poll for the second question, and I think you you asked a very easy question of the audience. Ah, very, so most of ah, very, <laughs> uh, very easy, very easy question, most easy question, and I am de disappointed of seeing that this is not hundred <laughs> percent. All right, uh, Dr. Valla, thank you so much for talking about an organ which, as you rightly said, is often neglected and overlooked during ultrasound examinations. Thank you very much. So we can move on to the next uh, topic, and that is uh, sonography of uterine masses. Uh, and the speaker is uh, Professor uh, K. Y. Leung. Uh, Professor Leung is uh, uh, no. from Hong Kong. Uh, he is a honorary. Uh, uh, he is a honorary consultant at Glen Eagles, an honorary associate professor, associate professor. at uh, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Hong Kong. He is the president of Hong Kong Society of Ultrasound in Medicine, director of Hong Kong branch of Ian e. Donald School of Medical Ultrasound. He is a ambassador of ISWAG. Is the chairman of education committee of APSAM. He was the chairman in the last tenure also, and he continues as the chairman in the current tenure also. He is a senior editor of Hong Kong Medical Journal. He is the editor of Journal of Pediatrics, Obstetrics, and Gynecology. He has authored four book chapters and published over 90 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He is going to speak on sonography of uterine masses. Over to you, Professor Liu. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kohali's uh, kind introductions. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the um, ultrasonography of a uh, uterine masses. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kohali for uh, the uh, organization of this um, uh, the uh, webinar. I think it's nice to have this. That we, um, and I get nice to see the um, awesome colleagues and also the um, the colleagues in the uh, in the India. Okay, so the ultrasonography of uterine masses that the, um, I think the most of the, um, my talk will be about the uh, terms and definition, uh, and the measurement of the, these, the, um, uh, uterine masses. I think it's important to highlight that the, the consensus opinion from the uh, morphological uterus uh, sonographic assessment group, um, that was the published in the White Journal in the 2015. That was the standardization of the uh, terms that you choose. Uh, because the examination of those science examiners that you choose is not uh, difficult. Um, but uh, we have to describe it and then the, the useful clinically and also in the um, meta-analysis and so on. So the standardization is to uh, reduce the intra arm and the entire observer variability in the innovation of the pathology, uh, especially the fibroid. Um, and then also to assess the effect of the medical and surgical treatment, uh, because we are talking about the fibroid, um, then the, uh, the, the, it has to be more specific in order to say that the, uh, whether the one form of a drug or the medication and one form of a surgery is effective or not. And then to compare the ultrasound images to other imaging techniques like, uh, the other, uh, maybe the MR or the, even the CT. Uh, and also facilitate the meta-analysis. And the most of all, I think that the uh, important issue is about to announce the safe use of a uh, minimal invasive technique for the treatment of uh, fibroid uh, if the diagnosis is reliable. This is important. If it's something that is the uh, malignant cancer, I think the minimal invasive procedure uh, should not uh, be the uh, choice of the treatment. But if you are sure about the diagnosis, it is something benign, then the, uh, it is more uh, and comfortable to use that kind of things, uh, the minimal invasive techniques, they like uh, the uh, ultrasound, the uh, therapy uh, of the fibroid, uh, not just for the diagnosis purpose. The setting would be either the transabdominal or transvaginal scan, that the, it depends on the uh, situation and also the patient's the wish. Uh, and then the uh, the small bladder is the, is good enough to check that there's not the big standard bladder. And then, and this is the two perpendicular planes. Um, maybe you can use also the 3D ultrasound if the, the, the uh, pop plane are available. And there's maybe you also use a hand to, or the pop, and then to facilitate the imaging of the plane, uh, 
to delineate the uh, fibroid or the endometriosis. The uh, measurement, I think that the most of the time that they, if you for stand up, that you may also measure the 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 uh, the inter three dimension, the length, the width, and also the depth. And then they sometimes include the uh, surface or not. Um, and also the, the, you can also measure the malmetrium thickness. It's a perpendicular measurement that they from one side or an anterior and also posterior uh, malmetrium thickness. And usually they will be um, the same um, in, in the normal circumstances. The other things that they um, sometimes is not the um, uh, key uh, defined it is the, the, uh, this, the junctional zone. This junctional zone is something that be between the endometrium and the malmetrium. So, um, in the front, in the coronal wheel, there's also this, and then the, in the, um, longitudinal wheel, and also in the transverse wheel. So this is a transfunctional song is now the complete assessment. Then the, you can use the 3D ultrasound, and then you can, the, uh, by the, uh, multi-panel analysis, you can, the, show the junctional song in the three planes, respectively. Or you can use the 2D, and then to check for the junctional song. Junctional song is something that is specific also for the assessment, of the eighteen myosis. So the junctional zone that you can see this is something is normal, irregular, and then or it can be irregular or interrupted. Interrupted means the location, I can also say this anterior, posterior, frontal, or left or right. Irregularity that the uh, you will also mention whether this is some cystic area, uh, uh hypogenic thoughts or hypogenic box and then nice, that would indicate that might be the uh adenomyosis. And then the measurement would be that the, the magnitude, the proportion, and also the size. Um, so you can see that this is, is something that Dr. Metric uh, saying is, is something normal, the junctional zone. And then it is something irregular. As you can see the junctional zone, this is something regular to that. And then this is something that disrupted, this is uh, here. And then this is uh, totally not uh, visible for the junctional zone. So you have a different the, um, the description about this, the, uh, the junctional zone. And then if there's just a mutual lesion, like the fibroid at the mouses, then, then you may have to um, think about the number, the location, the size, the size. And there's something that is not the um, commonly described is the outer lesion to the free margin and the inner lesion to the free margin uh, and the penetration and extent. So this is the size and the proportion uh, to the malmetrium, uh, either it's the di two-dimensional or even on the volume at the proportion. So, so that is something that is, is more, um, in the, um, uh, more the, uh, in extensive in the kind of, uh, uh, description. Or you can just say about that the, um, uh, this, the, the, is the common things that, uh, we usually report on the, um, ultrasound, uh, setting. So, um, the another thing is about the echogenicity. Uh, this is important that the, uh, this is the hypoechogenic, hypoechogenic is the mix. And then the surgery is also important. Is the also having that is the um, uh, different kind of a surgery that is the edge internal fan trip, and also that the uh, the cyst that is sometimes is uh, some cystic uh, inside or in the a um, the number of a uh, cyst in the endometrium, and also the amphigogenic island. Um, and then this is the ulnar size number, and also the this is some stuff at the mutual. Uh, echogenic lines and bugs that, that is corresponding to the, um, kind of endino, um, we will be, uh, discussed later. So this is uh, important about the, the uh, fickle classification of the uh, fibroid. So this, this is the, uh, things of that the, we, we, is important about the fibroid. This, this will highlight that the, um, the, uh, if you're going to have the, um, the, uh, uh, histoscopic removal of the fibroid, then of course if you know about the excess size of the fibroid, um, that this is more, so this is the, uh, great, uh, is the, uh, cosmic zero, that is mean that this is, uh, um, we need the inside the cavity, the tanconated inside the cavity. It's most is the inside the cavity, then this is the, uh, one, this is two is the, um, mostly inside the, um, malmutrium, and then the three is the, uh, inside the malmutrium and just the touch in the, the um, in the endometrium. And the four is the totally, uh, inside the malmutrium, and then the uh, fifth will be something that's mostly, uh, is the, um, uh, this, the, mostly, the, the, is the inside the, um, uh, malmetrium. This is sub -seroso. And then the sixth is the most is the sub -seroso. and the seven is the pitangulator. And the eight is something cervical or the other size that is spent. 
this is important for that uh, to to uh, know about um, the exercise. size. Um, so that the, this, this is the echogenicity of the fiber. So this one is uh, something that's the um, uh, hypo to the uh, to the uh, corresponding to my region. and this is, is something that the iso uh, unit the the echo and then this is echogenic more echogenic and then this is, is something uh, uh, the mix and then this is the echogenic and then there's something in time in some some acoustic changes as well so uh, this is the different um the types of the uh, fibroid echogenicity and then this is a shattering so there's, there's the something here and then you can so shattering that they hear that it's a certain some echogenicity to which the, the uh, more the echogenic is certain knife and then this is the uh, more echogenic this is a uh, uh, more shattering and then this is also the echogenic knife so this is uh, some shattering and this one just show the uh, shattering here and also the enhancement acoustic enhance, enhancement here because of the acoustic changes here so you can have the fiber even that uh, you can have a uh, this uh, demosis then you can have a different the uh, shattering in fact, so this might not be um, uh, the report in the, your ultrasound reporting. So this is the um, original lesion, it's a cystic thing, about the cystic, uh, this is endometrium, um, this is this uh, cyst, this is central ecomalgenic cyst, surrounded by some echogenic um, cyst, so um, these are the echogenic uh, box, and then the echogenic dot, the dot in the box. So these are the uh, features of the adeno. Uh, myosis. Uh, this also is showing that the submetrium, this is the endometrium, and then this is the submetrium 9, is here, the submetrium 9 here, and then the uh, some dot over here, and then the box over here, this is the endogenic, and then this cat. So these are the case of uh, the uh, adeno, the meiosis. And then we move on to the vascularity. So vascularity is said that the, um, the, um, this is uh, the vascularity, whether it's abundant or this is a field, and then if it's a lesion here, then you can see about it is whether the vascularization is in the circumferential or is it inside the lesion. Okay, this is something circumferential, the inside, so this is uh, circumferential, and then it's inside the, the lesion. So the fibroid usually does the, the uh, circumferential, that the wild well, entomosis is something uh, intra-lesional. Uh, so this is the vascularization that the, um, you can see that this is the uh, lesion that the uh, whether the uh, vascularization usually is something uh, perpendicular to the endometrium. Um, that is a, um, in the um, vascularization, then you can see the whole uterus, or this is some location of the vessel, vessel morphology that is something large or small, tortuous or regular. So this is more uh, specific in the, um, in the description of the work. So in clinical practice, I think it's important to about uh, that, that the, um, Check about that the uterine corpus, um, the malmutrium wall, echogenicity, malmutrium, if it's a malmutrium lesion, then you have to talk about the number, location, size, size, and the scheduling, the cyst, and then this, um, these, the, uh, functional shown, and the vascularity of the malmutrium. So this is uh, something that the, the, um, the, for the, um, uh, reporting. Um, that the, um, this is the ultrasound images of the uterus that the, at least, is the one with the general section. I think mean, this is very important about that the general section of the whole uterus, uh, the gray scale, it possibly will also act the color, uh, the preferably is also a, a, a transverse section or N or a coronal section. So it depends on the position of the uterus that the, at least you have a two perimeter pain in order to say that the whether the uterus is normal or not. Uh, if there's a uterine lesion, then at least that the uh, dark section uh, will be assumed that you enlarge the images and then do also act in the color topper and uh, in the color topper and then to see whether there is vascularization. Uh, sometimes you can also act in the 3D ultrasound to uh, to check the multi panel or the multi side uh, the paint. So this is the issue that is important about uh, the fundus because you can see the fundus then you can also look at this whether there is any fibroid here, it's funny here or even if there is uh, some pedunculated fibroid and then you can also use a hand to pass and then to see this, whether it's any, uh, pitanconated something to, otherwise you don't be, and you can see also the endometrium in, uh, clearly in order to see whether there's any sub endometrial, uh, the, the inside the, uh, pitanconated inside the fibroid inside the trine cavity. So we also have in the fast as well. Uh, the, uh, 
this is important to differentiate between the fibro and genomyosis because the treatment would be different and then the pathology is different that the uh, it is important. Uh, the, basically, the fibro will be more uh, well defined than the, the contour and then the uh, outline and also uh, the uh, echogenicity is the um, uh, it is can be mixed because it can be hypogenic, hypogenic, or even the uh, mix, so it may not be uh, useful uh, uh, to differentiate. Uh, the vascularity is the important of the circumferential. This is these outside in uh, 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 usually is low uh, in traditional flow. Uh, the junction zone is more also it is the uh, oak uh, can differentiate because unless it, it is something uh, distort into the mitochondrium, um, otherwise the, the junction zone should be seen. Um, in other places, do not be um, um, do not be disturbed. About the antinomyosis, that this is a globular and large uterus. Usually, that the uh, this is it um, the malvision thickening, uh, the asymmetrical of the thickening, and also the um, the uh, the um, there would be some uh, uh, the uh, subendometriosis or the abrogenic island, the um, the nine, uh, the nine and the bug. And also the uh, vasculization will be a transition, and then the junctional zone will be uh, distorted or irregular in that thing. So, and that is the typical of the adenomyosis. So, um, then uh, you can say, okay, so this is the fibroid. Typically, it is larger fibroid and measure uh, two dimension, and also the vasculization is in the peripheral, and this usually is the you know, uh, in transitional. Uh, uh, for vascularization. So this is also the, uh, the cogenicity, so maybe uh, the hypergenic, uh, some complication, the fibroid, where the fibroid, the vascularization, and the, this is a typical of the uh, uh, fibroid. So this is the, um, the uh, video showing that the uh, fibroid is a multiple fibroid, and since it's a multiple fibroid, um, so it's a single lady that's got the multiple fibroid, uh, 20, uh, five year old, and then this can see there's lots of a uh, large fibroid inside. Uh, the, uh, this is the, something uh, large. That is okay. So we are uh, also showing that the vascularization. Um, sometimes it can be very vascular, but basically that is multiple. But you can see that the the, five, the vascularization is um, the circumferential rather than the inside lesion, and this is the likely to be um, uh, the benign uh, 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 vascularization fibroid. Okay, so. Um, we use also the three dimensional scan and then to see this is the fiber here and then the scan fiber here, the same thing here, the different, then you can have a better uh, location. And then this is a multi, uh, slice, then the view of this, that this is the fiber in one thing and then the other side of the fiber, fiber. So you can have a different thing and then to, um, more deniely about how many fiber. Because if depending on the surgery, uh, maximum then, then you may have to, uh, uh, exactly know about how many fibroids that you're going to have and then the operate or you have, have the the um the ultrasound the operation is also have to know about except the the location and the number so this is the vaccination of fibroids the, the uh, 3d ultrasound image of the fibroid vaccination like this um okay so um the fibroid that is large and then the uh, in this case that you have a large uh, coupling in the anterior and posterior wall and this one is a very uh, small one that is on the posterior wall. Then this is the um, that, and then the, this is another hypergenic fibroid, and and then this is the uh, this fibroid here. Yeah? So it's a different location. So um, can also have this one. This is a fibroid. Here's the helium, okay, and then the fibroid is hypergenic, and this measure is the fundus here, and then the fibroid here. This is something pentagonated. So you may have to. Uh, the uh, use a hand and something uh, to move and then to open hook to move and then to uh, take the fibroid. So uh, another thing about this is also a fibroid taken uh, into the uh, endometrial property. So the different sites of the fibroid and also a different echogenicity as well. So this is the uh, uterus, this is a fibroid here and then this the uh, fibroid, the C6 changes. You can have uh, this uh, even is, uh, like a cyst, the C6 change fibroid. The vasculation yeah, in the peripheral, uh, this is not vascular. Um, the, so this is some atypical changes of the uh, fibroid, can have uh, these the cystic changes, uh, like uh, very uh, uh, ugly, the like fingers and like the hygogenic. Uh, this is the mix, the cystic degeneration actually is that, um, but this actually get a uh, very uh, atypical shape, and this also is cystic changes. 
And this is the endometrial cavity, get the, the fibroid extruding into the cavity, and then we have a vascularization. So this is the going to get is the FICO uh, one the state one fibroid. The uh, this is the important about that. This is a it, it is a sarcoma. Uh, it is not a fibroid, but this is a uh, some a typical feature, some acidic uh, transfer area here, and then there's a uh, very vascular, and then they may know about this is the uh, case of a sarcoma. So uh, we are about using the uh, vascularization that says, and then they also have seen a case of a fat sarcoma. This is the uh, very uh, vascular. That is the uh, VD thing about this. You can see a lot of vascularization here, and then the. Uh, so beware about that if there's something, uh, the menopausal lady that the fibroid, so-called fibroid certainly increase in size and the vascularization, then you have to aware that that may be something, uh, the, uh, the cancer. Okay. So, um, we move on to this is a tumorosis that the, uh, you have the ultrasound finding would be something echogenic site, nodules, arbitral cystic situation as the endometrial, uh, resulting from the endometrial and the, uh, endometrial glands in the tumor. And the is something that the muscular, the hypertrophy, doing so, you know, just the thickening of the myometrium and not to do with the, uh, that. Uh, then the vascularization would be the incrustalization and the penetrating vessels inside the lesion. So, uh, this is the, uh, typical is that the thickening of myometrium and then there's something, the, um, the hypogenic, uh, the iron, the some cystic, uh, the myometrial cyst, there's some, uh, uh, uh ice shattering. And then this is some um, the nine, that is that, and then the international vascularization. The junctional zone will be irregular, then this is that, this is the junctional zone is disturbed. Okay, so this is the endomyosis, so it's the thickening of the, this is the endometrium. You can see that the, the junctional zone is definitely, this is abnormal. There's a lot of uh, the, um, uh, the thickening, and also there's some uh, nine over here, the myometrial cyst, and then there's a nine here, and also and uh, you can see there's a thickening, because around here, this is lying, you see. So all these are the, the, uh, case of the adenomyosis. So, uh, again, this is something, uh, this is adenomyosis is here, just thickening. The conjo is not the, uh, is ill-defined. It's just the, the difference then, and the vascularization is inside, uh, the, the lesion. So this again, this is the, some, uh, adenomyosis. So, um, as I, DDX that does the eventual diagnosis something will not be bad it is the uh, vascular form of formation. This definitely this is the uh, very vascular than the uh, the, the adenomyosis. So so have to be aware about that. And then this the uh, can also be uh, something DDX will be the same individual carcinoma. So it can have a big set. Um the U defined the margin and then this is very vascular. So the presentation will be different, uh, some abnormal uh, uterine beating as well. So, so in summary, I think that they, I would say about this is standardization of terms and the description. Although it is they, they easy to say about the uterine masses that the definition is abnormal, but the, the standardization of terms and the description, and especially about that the, uh, is the consequence of fibroid, the uh, using the FECO, I think it is useful uh, for the clinical use and also to guide the clinician to say uh, kind of a treatment that they what kind of uh, management would be appropriate, whether it's a physioscopic or the um, or the we do receive uh, the uh, therapy. And also, the difference between the five point mouse is, um, of course, also the difference between uh, the uh, the cancer, the medicine things that the, um, because that do be, uh, the treatment will be totally uh, different. Okay, so um, thank you. So we would like to have some uh, questions about um, that the, uh, on the, on on these, the uh, Okay. All right, so, so we Okay. And till the um, poll goes on, I have a couple of questions from audience to okay. uh, to ask you. Okay. Uh, you talked about uh, FICO classification for fibroids, and we'll classify according to that. Do you use mapping also? Do you map the fibroids? Yes, of course. Uh, the, uh, we can also use the map to to uh, specify that. The um, I think that the um, the. Uh, hmm? Yeah, I think mean, it's, it's just about that the uh, whether uh, you be use that the uh, center format and then to, to report. I think whatever that the uh, the uh, uses, the, I think the most useful is the uh, standardization standardization of the um, of the terminology or the report thing, and then the um, how um, use the uh, map and then to to say is it or use a diagram and then to uh, 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 to 
to uh, specify the size. That is more than say, how many cases, whether it's uh, uh, inside the cavity and how many is the outside uh, distribution. So, so that is, is the important. Matter. Okay. Now you have the Paul. Would you like to comment on that? Hmm. Yeah. I think this is uh, the um, yes. I think that the uh, the answer is yes. That the um, under the same general the unconscious of the yeah. That that is the not not the classification the pickle classification. Uh, I think that the most of the um, the uh, answer got it right. Um, and the the uh, because it is just the contact with the cells is not that uh, important. That the I think it's the contact with the endometrium is more important uh, for the clinical sense. Of course, that you can have a different. Uh, a description is okay, but uh, they are uh, not in that. Okay. All right. Uh, till they run the poll on your second question, uh, yeah. I have one more question from the audience. Um, uh, you okay. talked about the junctional zone. Uh, do yeah. you use a cutoff value for thickness of the junctional zone? Yeah. I think the junctional zone is something that is a, uh, usually not uh, described, but uh, it depends on the um, and the resolution of the ultrasound. So if you have uh, the highly, um, uh, the, then you can uh, clearly see the functional zone. Otherwise, uh, the, um, you may not be able to clearly say and then to uh, describe or to comment whether the, there's a distortion or not. Uh, um, but I think that the, um, if you are going to, uh, for the adenomyosis, that the, the junctional zone would be, would be uh, useful. At, at all, uh, it would be useful because of the, the junction zone is the one thing that uh, the size will be disturbed by the endomyosis. I think uh, the, uh, you also think about that the uh, which of them is the, to, less useful to differentiate uh, five ball endomyosis. I think that the, uh, all these are the um, are useful. I just said the, uh, the echogenicity, I think it's less useful that the, I think it's the most of the attendants that they un get the right answer. Um, because the outline usually the, the fiber would be the outline would be uh, easier to see more uh, regular and then the uh, is easier seen and the junction zone also uh, disturbed that in the mouse so you have to if, if this is the um, uh, at the mouse you have to look carefully about the junction zone um, then the, this is usually and that would be uh, that disturbed with the mouse uh, sees the mouse nine and also that and then the vascularity is also uh, would be uh, something as a malmutualization, then of course you can use the, the, the vascularization to change the circumferential, the fiber, international, as the mode and the mounted. Or the echo intensity is uh, sometimes it's a mix that they do you not. Know. But it's really echogenic, of course you can say it is just a fiber that but uh, sometimes okay. it is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Liu, for that uh, excellent mm -hmm. talk on uh, uterine masses. Now let us move on to the last uh, talk of uh, today. And that is uh, by Dr. Teal and Praveen, and he is going to talk on ovarian masses. Dr. Praveen is uh, Director of Consultant at Abhishek's Institute of Imagiology, is a Consultant Diagnostic Radiology in Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad, is a past president of IFMB, president of Society of Fetal Medicine, past vice president of Indian Radiological and Imaging Association, is a recipient of several awards, including certificate of excellence for being part of the team to perform the first coronary angioplasty in India in 1985. He has authored chapters, textbooks, several publications. His main area of interest are fetal and gynecological imaging. He is one of the most popular speakers in his field and I'll tell you that he is a avid marathoner and he has probably run uh, almost uh, all of the popular international marathons. So over to you Praveen. Praveen such a wonderful, wonderful uh, webinar. I think in this four hours, you made all of us uh, cover the entire ultrasound in abdomen. And uh, I think the speakers were excellent and they have, uh, everyone has given us a very lucid picture about various aspects of uh, various abdominal organs. Now today I will be talking to you on ovarian masses. And uh, how is it that we are going to evaluate the ovarian masses taking the IOTA approach? 
Now, when we talk about uh, the uh, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, one of the common clinical requests that we get is to evaluate the adnexal masses. When we talk about the adnexal masses, the most important organ that we are going to focus upon is the ovary. And uh, whenever we think in terms of the ovarian mass, the most important aspect is to categorize or classify it into a benign and a malignant mass where ultrasound plays an extremely important role. Now, as we all know, the ovarian cancer is <laughs> most little gynecological malignancy and uh, prognostication actually depends on early detection. If they are diagnosed very early, the prognostication is favorable in stage 1 and stage 2 tumors, whereas if it is diagnosed late, then it, 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 the 5-year survival rate is only less than 30%. So why is this happening? That why, why, why is it that we diagnose it late? The reason is that we lack standardized terms, a lesion description, and evaluating procedures in gynecological ultrasound. That is where the IOTA comes into play. Uh, IOTA is nothing but the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Group. This group has postulated a strategy to categorize adnexal masses into benign as well as malignant lesions. Now, the role of IOTA is that they have introduced uh, certain um, important terms that have to be used in evaluating or describing the adnexal lesions. So they are they are supposed to be. It is used to describe the lesions, recognize the recognize the uh, the, the lesions as well as uh, there are ten simple three. 10 simple rules uh, which can also be used and also the mathematical uh, models which can be used in evaluating the ovarian or the adnexal masses. Now, they have proposed three-step approach. The three-step approach is that we have to go about evaluating the lesion based on easy descriptors or pattern recognition. That is one. Two, we can use the simple IOTA rules, basically five benign and five malignant uh, features. Or we can also use or refine our diagnose by using what is called as the mathematical models such as the LR1, LR2 as well as adnex model. So this is how we are going to approach whenever we find an adnexal mass in our day-to-day -day practice. Now let us get into each of these things which will help us in uh, categorizing these adnexal lesions as benign or malignant lesion. First and foremost thing is the pattern recognition of easy descriptors. This is basically intended to tell us that uh, Whenever we see a particular lesion, there are certain classical descriptions that are being attributed to a particular lesion which clinches the diagnosis. We don't need to do anything further. For example, in this uh, a premenopausal young lady where we have uh, an, admit, uh, an, an ultrasound examination, transvaginal ultrasound examination, we find that it's a very well circumscribed brown glass appearing lesion which is on ultra, transvaginal ultrasound when you try to push it, it we know that it is adherent. And we also have what is called as layer in layer appearance. Which Praveen, we are not yeah. able to see your screen. You are not able to see my screen? Oh. No. Sorry. Now. Uh, okay. Not yet. Can you see my screen? Dr. Praveen, on the top you can see the screen sharing option. Yeah, I know, I know, I have shared that. Okay, anyway, I'll share again. No, sorry. Uh, please uh, unshare and share again. Uh, sh uh, yeah, I think uh, now is it okay? I'll do one thing. Can you see the screen? Not yet. No. No, you can't see the screen? No. No, sir. Okay, I'll again do that. No, I think I'm able to see the screen. I'll do one. I'll come back again. Sorry. Sorry for it. First open this one. Then see this. No? 
video. Can you click on PPT? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so um, when you use your transducer to push the lesion and try to evaluate the adherence of the lesion, uh, and also you can have this uh, typical appearance of a layer in layer appearance, which is classical of a endometrioma. So, now the other situation is that uh, you may have a, a unilocular uh, solid looking lesion with mixed echogenicity wherein you have a, a hypoechoic area, uh, I mean a cystic area, a hypoechoic area with a hyperechoic area and also a caustic shortening. In a premenopausal woman, the first and foremost diagnosis will be dermoid. So these are the lesions where you have very classical features which are very, very typical and gives you a pathological diagnosis very easily. That's this is why they're called as easy descriptors of pattern recovery. Now, this is another lady, uh, a young lady with uh, uh, lower abdominal pain for an examination, ultrasound examination, trans abdominal shows a well circumscribed anaphytic area with clear margins, no solid component. You do a 3D rendering and you find that there is no internal echo or there is no solid component. The maximum diameter is actually less than 10 millimeters. It has to be a simple system. Now, the other situation is that when you find this sort of a uh, unilocular lesion with septations, thin septations, and when you use your transducer to push the one and to you solid looking lesion, it is usually because of the clot. So this is the classical appearance of a hemorrhagic system. Similarly, you have another lesion which is which is very classically described is that in an elderly woman, postmenopausal woman with uh, in, I mean, uh, uh, solid mass, uh, presence of ascites, and you put the current off along, you find that there is increased mass clarity, you know that you are dealing with it. Ovarian cancer. So these are the lesions which have very, very typical appearances, which gives you, clinches the diagnosis, pathological diagnosis, where you don't need to do anything further. Now, there are certain situations where you may not be having this sort of a classical appearances. In that situation, we need to describe the lesion in a proper perspective as described by IOTA guidelines. In this, the IOTA guidelines describe these lesions as a unilocular cyst where you don't have a solid component, well circumscribed cyst. And you, you have a unilocular but solid component, so it is called as a unilocular solid. Sometimes you have a multilocular cyst where there is no cyst to solid component here, whereas here in this particular case, we have solid component associated with multilocular. So you call it as a multilocular cyst and you call this as a multilocular solid lesion. These are the various descriptions that have been, that have been proposed. And here we have an absolutely solid, lobulated, irregular mass. On colored offer, you find that there is extremely so this is a typical solid lesion. So taking the consistency of the lesion, if you try to categorize them, wherever there is a solid component, the possibility of malignancy is very high. So whenever you have a so unilocular solid with uh, where the malignancy will be about 37 percent, whenever it is multilocular with solid, it is about 37, and it is solid, it is about 67 percent. Now, not only that, you need to describe the cyst content. The cyst content can be absolutely anechoic or it can be in the form of the brown glass, or it can be mixed echogenic where there can be hyperechoic with acoustic shadowing, or there can be thin septations as you can see in a hemorrhagic cyst. Then comes the internal wall. So these are all the various descriptions that have been described in order to come to a reasonable conclusion and differentiate between malignant and benign lesions. Here we have a typical appearance of a uh, lesion well circumscribed cystic lesion which has no solid component so when and then the internal echoes are very clear and here we have uh, one more lesion where we have a, a, a well circumscribed lesion but you have popular capillary projections within the cyst so it is not smooth it is irregular so the possibility of malignancy is very high as we take the internal uh, wall we also have to consider the external wall of the lesion external wall Whenever it is very smooth and clearly well defined, you need to think in terms of a possible benign lesion. Whenever you have this sort of a lobulated irregular appearance, you need to think in terms of a malignant lesion. So these are all the various descriptions that have been proposed in order to come to a conclusion whether the lesion which we are dealing with is a benign or a malignant lesion. Because the goal of uh, all of us whenever we deal with adnexal region is to categorize them as benign and malignant because the approach and management will be entirely different based on that particular uh, diagnosis. So when we have this sort of a papillary projections, you need to measure the diameter of the papillary projection. And if the papillary projection is more than 7 millimeters, then you know that you are dealing with a, a, a malignant lesion. If the papillary projection's length or the diameter is less than 7, 
you know that you are dealing with a probably a, a, a bill negation. Now, there are certain situations where you do find certain strands of tissues which are originating from one wall to the other wall. If it is extending entirely, then you call it as a complete local or a complete population. And if it is reaching from one wall to another wall, then you need to think in, I mean, you need to assess the thickness of the septation, whether they are thick or whether thin. And if it is thin and if it is less than three, we know that we are dealing with benign lesions. But then thickness alone may not clinch the diagnosis of malignant or, in, in, uh, or benign. Sometimes you do find certain incomplete, that is you can see a septa arising from one wall, but it doesn't reach the other wall, which is very, very typical of it of a hydrosal things. So these are the various factors which we have to keep in mind. Similarly, there are certain additional factors which we have to keep in mind. One is the fluid in the Douglas pouch or the fluid in the Morrison's pouch, which is just to an aside. So associated uh, features, uh, features which are associated with previously described uh, lesions. If you find this sort of an additional feature, you need to think in terms of a possible malignancy. Now, Whenever we find a lesion, as, as, as we all practice, we do start evaluating the vascularity of the lesion and the vascularity of the lesion is best assessed by putting on the color Doppler. Now, whenever we try to use color Doppler in pelvic examination, particularly interrogating the pelvic vessels, we need to set our Doppler settings very, very um, I mean, accurately. The reason is that we know that the pelvic vasculature has a low flow pattern. So whenever we deal with low flow pattern, unless you are going to use proper color Doppler settings, you may not be able to appreciate the vascularity or you may not be able to appreciate the, the color flow. So in that situation, what we do is we either use a color Doppler, but quite often I prefer to use a power Doppler because it's more sensitive. That's one. Second important thing is you always need to use a small color box because the smaller the color box, the better the frame rate, the better the resolution. That is one. Two, as the flow is very low, you try to use low filters at the same time, moderate persistence. And then whenever you try to evaluate the spectral waveform, your angle of insulation should not be more than 60. That it should always be less than 60 degrees. And the sample gate, the one which is which the gate or the sample gate which you are going to use uh, has to be small because the vessels which you are going to interrogate are small and tortuous. That is the reason why you need to use a smaller uh, sample gate. And then the velocity scale uh, basically the, the velocity scale depends on the amount of flow that takes place in the vessels. Usually in the pelvic viscera, you take, you have uh, velocity flows between about, uh, about 10 centimeters per second. So that is the reason why you fix the velocity scale between 3 to 6 centimeters. And PRF should be about 0.3 to 0.6. Quite often I use 0.6 because 0.3 usually gives you flashy appearances. And the Doppler gain settings, the Doppler gain, we should be just below the artifact level. This is an extremely important uh, exercise that one has to follow in order to get a proper color perception of the lesion that we are going to interrogate. Once that is done, then we can categorize subjectively with, depending on the amount of color flow that you see in these particular lesions as color scores. Whenever there is no color flow that you are going to appreciate in spite of again, uh, adjusting your color Doppler settings properly, then you call it as color score one. If you find minimum flow, flow, then you call it as color score 2, similarly color score 3. And when you find abundant flow, then you call it as color score 4. Now, these are the typical examples of color scores where you see that there is a, uh, a well-circumscribed cyst with a ground glass appearance and a solid con looking lesion uh, projecting into the cyst. And when you put the color doctor on, there is no color flow within the lesion. Whereas here, you do find the solid component and there is minimal color flow that you can see. So it is color 1, color 2. And there is moderate color flow in this particular ovary. And here there is abundant color flow. This is color three and this is color flow. So this is how you are going to uh, 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 subjectively categorize the color color scores uh, as far as the vascular pattern is concerned. Now, once we have acquired the lesion description, the internal component, external wall, as well as the vascular of the lesion, we try to use certain simple iota, simple rules, which have been postulated, which are categorized as 10 rules, five features as I mean, you call it as the M features and B features. M features are nothing but M ultrasound features are nothing but the malignant features on ultrasound and B features are nothing but the benign features on ultrasound. So taking that into consideration, let us start off with the benign features or the B features. When we say B features, we can categorize them into five. That is, these are the five features that we have to consider. One, whenever you find just a lesion which is unilocular, you call it as B1. 
presence of a small solid component which the diameter is less than 7 mm you put it as b2 presence of acoustic shadowing acoustic shadowing is one of the most important factor which can tell us that you are dealing with a benign lesion quite often you don't have acoustic shadowing and malignant lesion whenever you have a smooth multilocular tumor with the size which is less than 10 cm you know it is b4 and no blood flow color is the color score 1 it is b5 now similarly these are the various examples where you have a unilocular lesion where there is no solid component so it is b1 it is classical of a benign lesion whereas here you have a solid component but the size of it is less than 7 mm so you know that you are dealing with b2 the reason why we are trying to categorize them into various uh, b features is that this will help us in categorizing the lesions as benign and malignant similarly whenever you have an acoustic shadowing as you can see here you know that you are dealing with b3 multilocular which is less than 10 centimeters and there is no blood flow you know that you are dealing with b4 and b5 coming to the m features or the malignant features we have m1 where we find that there is an irregular solid mass so b1 was a clear cyst m1 is an irregular solid mass here there is an associated feature that is the presence of ascites presence of ascites is one of the uh, 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 unfavorable features and it is in favor of a malignancy not only that, whenever you have papillary projections, which are more than four papillary projections, one has to be suspicious. Malignant, see, and that is why it is called as M3. And whenever you have an irregular multilocular solid tumor, which is more than 10 centimeters, you have to consider the possibility of a malignant lesion. When you put the color doctor on and you find that there is intense blood flow or you have a color score 4, then you know that you are dealing with a malignant lesion. So these are the typical examples. You have a solid irregular mass, which is M1. Ascites, presence of ascites, M2, multiple polyps which are more than four in number, M3, and there, there is a loculated cystic mass with solid component which measures more than 10 centimeters. You know that you are dealing with M4, abundant color flow and intense blood flow. Then you know you are dealing with the color score 4, which is suggestive of M5. So taking all these factors into consideration, so basically we have started evaluating the features of the lesion. Once we have, uh, I mean, got the features of the lesion, we have started categorizing them as M features and P features. And based on that, we are going to interpret the lesion. So if you have one or more M features and no or absent B features, that means you are dealing with malignant lesion. So there are one or more M features which are highly suggestive of malignant lesion. Similarly, if you have one or more B features and no M features, then you are dealing with B lesions. But the problem comes when you have both M and B features or you don't have M and B features, then it becomes inconclusive. So this is the interpretation that you are going to achieve by considering the simple rules of IOTA. Now the problem comes with this inconclusive group, which have to be further evaluated based on various other parameters. Now, this is the risk calculation based on simple rules. As I said, if there is no M feature, and if it has, if we have more than two B features, you know that you are dealing with very, very low possibility of a malignancy, that is 0.29. Whereas if you have no M features, but uh, two B features, not more than two, but only two B features, the possibility is 2.7. If you have uh, only one B feature, then the possibility is 3.1. Whereas if you have no M features, but one B features, which is except B1, B1 is very, very typical of a very clear cyst. So we accept that B1, if you have any other B features, you have to think in terms of a, I mean, the, the possibility of malignancy is about 15.2. No, no features, then the possibility is very high, that is 48.7. Equal number of M and B features, one has to very strongly suspect the possibility of 78% and, and uh, zero M, M, M features but more B and, and M features than you have to think in terms of 20. So this is how you are trying to uh, categorize the risk on based on the various lesion descriptions that you have come, come to. Now, when once you have come to that level where there are certain inconclusive situations, you need to start using mathematical models. These are the mathematical models which have been proposed, which are called as the LR1, LR2. These mathematical models are available as mobile apps on your uh, Android phone or you can download them onto your Android phone or Apple phone and these apps can be acquired by qualifying for IOTA class, uh, certification examination but nowadays it is fully available on net and these mathematical models are as sensed to as an evaluation by an expert. Uh, in LR1 we have 12 variables and in LR2 we have 6 variables. Now when you come to 12 variables which are seen in LR1 we consider the age, 
personal history, whether there was any history of previous history of ovarian tumor, you say yes or no. And the largest in the diameter of the lesion, largest diameter of the lesion of the solid component which is there, and the presence of ascites, yes or no. And then irregular cyst wall, internal cyst wall, presence of purely solid tumors, color score, if it is one, two, three, you have to put all these things and fill them up so that you get an answer. I'll show you how it works. Similarly, we have six. It's more, more than seven or not, and then irregular cyst wall, um, yes or no, you know, and the presence of a caustic shadow. So these are the six uh, uh, variables that you are going to fill in. Now I'll just show you how it works. This is a, um, a mobile wherein you have downloaded the app. This is the IOTA app. Once you tap the IOTA app, you can go into the IOTA app, and there you can find a simple rules. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you can find the simple. Okay, um, where you get the IOTA app and then once the IOTA app is um, used, then you can go on and try to evaluate the various things like you have the LR1, LR2 and simple rules. You can use any one of them and once you use, let us say we use LR1 where there are 12 variables, you have to uh, give the age of the patient. If you don't give the age of the patient, it calls for it, it asks for it. So presence of ascites, yes or no, presence of papillary projections and you try to maximum diameter, you can fill it up. And you can say calculate, calculate. There is a calculation button here. Once you calculate, then it tells you that you have not given the age of the patient. So it asks for the age of the patient. So you go back and fill the age of the patient. And not only that, it also asks for the color, color flow. And so you need to give the color flow also. Select the type of flow. If you select this type of flow, let us say moderate or mild or whatever it is, and then ask for the calculations. Then once you do that one, you will get the Yes, and then you have asked for the calculation. It says 43.2% of possibility of a, of a malignancy. Now, similarly, you can use LR2 where you fill the age of the patient and presence and absence of the ascites, presence of the papillary projections with detectable blood flow, maximum diameter, and then maximum diameter is about 11 millimeters, presence and absence of the no. So it tells us that there is 37% possibility of a malignancy. You can use even similarly, you can use the, the simple rules where you can fill the, uh, the various components which are being requested. So that gives you an ask for calculation that then tells you well, how, how much is the possibility. But then once you have categorized them as benign and malignant lesion, it is also essential that we need to estimate the probability of an adnexal tumor. That is, is it a, is a, how much probability is it a benign lesion? What is the probability of be it being a borderline lesion? How much is the probability of it being cancer stage 1, stage 2 and 4 or secondary metastasis? Because it's extremely important because your management strategies vary based on this uh, identification. So you can use this Adnex app. This Adnex app has got nine variables of which three of them are clinical variables. That is age, serum uh, CA125 and the type of center. Quite often you don't need to enter the CA125 as well as the type of the center, but these are six ultrasound variables are extremely important where you can take the maximum diameter of the lesion, proportion of the solid tissue, more than 10 cystic number of papillary projections, presence or absence of the acoustic shadow, and then the ascites. Once you do that, then you get an answer. I'll show you how you are going to uh, make use of this particular ADNEX model. Now, coming to the ovarian tumors classification based on WHO, they have class categorized them as epithelial tumors, terminal tumors, and sex card tumors. If you take the epithelial tumors, which are the most commonest, which account for almost 90% of them, the 10 to 20% of them are borderline. Of this borderline, serous and mucinous are the commonest, and the serous accounts to almost about the 53%, mucinous accounts to about 32%, zero mucinous one, and other components are account to about less than 5%. Whereas the general tumors, as you can call them as the, the germ cell tumors, where you can find that there could be a dysgerminoma, yolk sac, it is usually about 15 to 20 percent, whereas the sex card tumors about 5 to 10 percent, which are extremely rare in our practice. Now, let us talk a little bit about the borderline tumor because this is one of the problem which the problem areas where it is it's called also known as the neuromalignant potential tumor. So typically it is associated with 
atypical epithelial proliferation without the stromal invasion. So that is a very classical description of the borderline tumor. Uh, that is the reason why it is also known as ovarian epithelial tumor and uh, it is usually seen in younger age group and the unique feature is that there will be a profuse of papillary projections into the cystic area. Not only that, another typical appearance which has been described off late in 2020 is that they have what is called as microscopic appearance. Actually, this is a very interesting feature which we all the time missed it in the sense previously whenever we saw this sort of lesions, I, when I retrospectively saw these lesions, then I could find that these are the multiple microscopic cysts which are very, very typical of a borderline tumor. So once you have this sort of an appearance where you have this sort of microscopic cyst, you know that you are dealing with a borderline tumor. So this is one good clue that we have all have to remember as far as uh, diagnosing borderline tumors. Now coming to the very... Praveen, you have got two, three minutes. Uh, three minutes? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so cancer stages, I will not take much time as far as the cancer staging is concerned because all of you know it. Now the present concept in evaluating the ovarian lesions is, uh, it is based on histopathological, molecular and genetical, genetic constitution and it is categorized in two. Type 1 is that the ovary has a precursor lesion within the ovary and it includes low grade serous mucinous epidermoid clear cell and transitional cell carcinoma. But as the tumors uh, is confined to the ovary and it is stable genome without TP53 mutation. Whereas type 2 is the one which is usually de novo from the tube or the ovarian surface epithelium. It includes highly aggressive undifferentiated carcinomas and carcinomas, uh, carcinosarcomas. Now how are we going to go about it? So the major goal is to categorize them as benign and malignant. It is achieved by simple rules. But then prediction of the tumor probability is basically done by uh, our next model. So I'll just show you two or three lesions so that you can make use of this thing. So we have a, a, on a Monday morning, we have a patient who is referred to you with an adnexal mass about 48 years old, perimenopausal, presence with lower abdominal pain. You do a transvaginal examination, find a multilocular solid tumor, which is more than 10 centimeters, put the color doctor on, find an abundant lesion. Now with this lesions itself, by taking the simple rules, you know that there are two M, M features and no B features. Definitely you are more in favor of a malignant lesion, but then you would like to categorize them further. So you use LR2 where you can use six variables. It tells us that there is 27.3% possibility of malignant, but then usually LR2 uh, uh, regression model usually underestimates malignancy. So you try to use the adnex model where you, there is, you can just go on online which is available online and you fill this form like age of the patient and these components which are six variables which are there on adnexal model and that gives you exactly what is the possibility of a benign lesion, what is the possibility of malignancy, what is the possibility of the lesion. So this is how you are going to categorize these lesions. There are two more cases which uh, if time permits I'll show or I'll stop it here. There's no problem. Uh, this is another lady who uh, 36 year old. Uh, presence with lower abdominal pain, an ultrasound examination, color doppler shows uh, sparse vascularity, very clear cystic area with uh, papillary projections. Uh, and on uh, uh, sim taking simple rules into consideration, there are no malignant M features, but one benign feature. So it is categorized as B lesion. When you use the LR2, it shows that the possibility of malignancy is only 5.4. And then you put it on at next, and that gives you the very clear the risk of benign lesions is 84, 88.4, whereas risk malignancy, risk of malignancy is only 11.6. Yet, lesion where we have a very characteristic feature, where we find that there are multiple papillary projections which are definitely more than 7 millimeters and there are intense vascularity. Looking at it, uh, taking the simple rules into consideration, we know that we have two malignant uh, uh, features, one benign feature, so it becomes inconclusive. In that situation, you use the LR2 which tells us that the possibility of malignancy is 25.9. You put the adnexal model into use where you know that the benign risk of benign lesion is 73.9, whereas risk of malignancy is 26.1 and borderline tumors are 73. So this is how you are going to categorize all the lesions. So accurate categorization of adnexal lesions as benign and malignant is extremely important. You know that it is ovarian cancers are the lethal um, gynecological uh, malignancies. Prognostication is extremely important. IOTA, easy description, simple rules, LR1, LR2, adnexal models are extremely useful in risk categorizing these lesions. 
and lesions cannot be uh, categorized if without the malignant lesion. Whenever you cannot categorize them, you have to consider them as a malignant lesion. Thank you very much. Now, can we go on to the questions? In between, if you have some questions, you can ask me Sudhir, from the audience. All right. Um, thanks, Praveen. Um, there are uh, just a couple of questions. One question is um, how to differentiate a, a chronic ectopic from a ovarian tumor. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, we are dealing with a adnexal mass. So once we have an adnexal mass, you need to clearly describe uh, whether that adnexal mass is benign or malignant. This can be done basically by using all these simple rules uh, taking into consideration. When once you have come to a conclusion that it is a benign lesion, you cannot categorize them basically as a chronic ectopic unless you have other biometric biomet bio biochemistry available with you. So uh, taking that into consideration, probably you can say it is chronic ectopic because it comes under benign lesion. Based on that, you can always say that it is a uh, uh, chronic ectopic. Okay, uh, this is yeah. diagnosis, the, which, the features which we have shown you, um, I actually, uh, it is very, uh, it's a typical appearance because I have shown you that image also in my talk where you find a mixed echogenic. You have a cystic area, you have a hypoechoic area, you have hyperechoic area with acoustic shadowing. Remember, whenever you find an acoustic shadowing, it has to be a benign lesion. It cannot be a malignant lesion. And not only that, when you see the vascular, the vascularity was also sparse. That is, you can say that color score two. So it is a benign lesion. It was a dermoid. It was not a malignancy. I'm disappointed by this. Right. So till they run the next poll, yes, uh, yes. there is one more question. Do yes. you get solid lesions in endometrios, endometriosis, endometriomas, ovarian yes. endometriomas? Yes, yes. They are called as solid looking endometriomas. They are called as solid looking endometriomas. But then if you put the color Doppler on, if the endometrioma is active or it is aggressive, in that situation it is very difficult to differentiate an endometrioma from an endometrial, I mean ovarian cancer. Whereas if the uh, lesion is not active or inactive, then usually the vascularity will be very, very sparse. That is, it can be color score one or color score two. So based on that, you can differentiate one from the other. And of course, you have the other features like you use the transducer to push, you have the tenderness being elicited, all those features also you take into consideration before you label them as an endometrium rather than an ovarian malignancy. Okay. Uh, let us have the, the results of the poll. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So they understood the M features very clearly. So I'm very happy that uh, most of them could identify that the, the one which is not there in the M features is the uh, at least two papillary. Actually, you get more than two. That is uh, more than four papillary projections, which is very classical of a uh, M feature. Thank, Thank you, Praveen. Thank you for that uh, excellent talk on ovarian tumors and the outer uh, classification. It has been a wonderful <laughs> webinar with uh, support from all the prestigious faculty that I have had. And we have had an overwhelming response from the audience all over the Asian countries. Uh, now I would uh, uh, invite uh, the president of AFSAM, uh, Professor Young Liang Wan, to say a few words. Can we have Dr. Young Liang Wan on the screen, please? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the Asian Federation of Society of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology, it is my honor and pleasure to give a few words in this closing webinars. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate Dr. Gokhil for your time and effort in organizing this webinar. It is a great job you did. I would also like to appreciate IFUMB and all the distinguished speakers in this webinar. The speakers include uh, two or three from the IFUMB, five or six from the 
Afsam. All of them, each of them made a speech for 30 minutes. They also provide a wood quiz so that all the audience learn a lot. To my knowledge, so far I know, there are more than 1,200 audience that joined this meeting, registered meeting. And not only that, this audience also spent a lot of time in listening the lecture. That means the scientific program that was designed by Dr. Gokhel, IFUMB, and AFSOM is very great. It is very interesting and attractive. And I hope that all these topics will be beneficial to all the audience so that will be helpful in their daily work in taking care of the patient. Thank you very much for your participants. Especially my appreciation goes to all the audience, especially their support. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong. Um, I would also like to invite uh, Professor Wong J. Lee the immediate past president and professor from Korea to say a few words. Professor Lee, thank please. You. Thank, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Kokhale, all honorable speakers and G members for successful organization of this second AFSUM G webinar. I believe all participants enjoyed this webinar and could learn informative knowledge. And I also believe this uh, webinar could de uh, develop uh, some geo webinar more productively. Thank you again, all of you, for joining this webinar and have a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, Professor Leung, uh, Chairman, Education Committee, would you also say a few words for our audience? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Koharis, and I think that the uh, thank the also the uh, IT team. Uh, you expect IT team to support this uh, webinar. I think it's nice in the on this uh, Sunday. Uh, I think the, all the speakers and the um, and also the attendance to be um, learned a lot from this. That the um, I think that from the uh, EC Education Committee point of view, I think this uh, kind of uh, webinar is uh, the important and then they uh, would uh, support this kind of activity uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leung. And uh, we come to the end of uh, today's webinar. I thank uh, all the faculty, Professor Wan, Professor Lee, Professor Leung, Professor Jun Yong Cho, Professor Kanu Bala, Professor Nitin Chawal, Dr. TLN Praveen, and not the least, uh, team from GE who helped us uh, uh, do this webinar. Uh, thank you, Zenith. And uh, not the least, the, the back office uh, headed by Rishikant and team, they have been fantastic in supporting this webinar. And to get all these people together from different time zones, logged in at the same time. And I'm told that we have had uh, more than 1,200 uh, delegates uh, log in to this webinar. And our back office says that uh, the interest in webinar was significant because the time spent logged in has been significantly more than what, has they, what they have experienced in the last few webinars. So thank you all of uh, you again. Thank you, GE, and thank you, the back office. And I say goodbye on behalf of uh, AFSAM, on behalf of IFUMB, and on behalf of all the distinguished faculty that participated in this webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye. Have a nice weekend and stay safe. Stay safe from the corona pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gurukhle. Thank you for a wonderful uh, webinar. And uh, I would like to thank all our esteemed faculty for conducting for this wonderful webinar today. And a special vote of thanks to all of our viewers joining from different parts of the Asia. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.